My Family Thinks I'm Crazy, a podcast where I, your host, try to give you some tips on how you can explain all this weird, wild, crazy conspiracy stuff to the people you love most, because that's what I've been trying to do for the past 10 years with no success. I've been telling everybody that I got a minute shade. Again, with your, Mark being Mark again. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's the thing about podcasts is when you're on the air, and it's like therapy, you know. If I can't talk to my family about this stuff, I'll talk to you, Matt, and all our listeners. You know, just tell your whole podcast. Yeah. So, who are we talking about today, Matt? seems to be the dominating control groups of today if it allows them to dominate so successfully so long just an interesting thing to consider because you also have like the russian um revolution the bolshevik revolution seem to be driven by uh, a secret society called the black hand and then if you look at it stalin stalin you catch him in a picture doing the hidden hand symbolism he seems to have a connection to freemasonry and the Bernai brith which is now the anti-defamation league which you know gotta be careful I was like, whoa, now I get it. Now I see like all this psychedelic art and stuff made a lot of sense to me right then at that moment. And I was like, okay, this is no drug. This is like way beyond like, this is the shit that they don't want to know about. So then ever since then, I've been just exploring, you know, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. I am your host, Mystic Mark, and in this weird, wild world of lies, illusions, and disharmonious frequencies, it's good to know that I'm not the only one seeing it. And today's guest, a supporter of the show, filled me in on some of the things he's seen and some of the things he's done in his life, and I thought it would be interesting to have him on the show and get into how he awoke to this madness that we're living in. And to add to that, Kent Woods, today's guest, came to realize this through a totally different realm than I, through the realm of music. So today's guest, Kent Woods, a musician and a now researcher. And here we are, folks, in the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast 2.0. Shorter intros and extended outros. Stick around for the second conversation in today's two-for-one special That's right, every Wednesday we're going to have an extended outro with a guest. And really, this conversation was a whole podcast in and of itself. If I didn't have as many episodes in the backlog as I do, I might have put this out as its own episode. But not to worry, Evan will be back for his own full episode. And I believe Evan is also a musician, as well. So that's cool that they're both here in this same podcast together. So at the end of the conversation with Kent Wood, stick around for the beginning of a conversation with Evan D from the Occult 45 podcast, a new podcast that is coming to you through the same apps that you listen to this podcast on. Look at that. Go subscribe. The episode notes have all the links you need to follow up with the guests, Kent Wood's and Evan D. Oh, and Evan D's also been on Zero uh, last year, so be sure to check that out if you're on Rockfin. And if you're on Rockfin, you know what I'm going to say. Check out all the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy uh, exclusive content there. We have a couple episodes, given that we have a backlog that are there that are not out on audio yet. And don't worry, Patreon subscribers, those videos will be available to you very soon. As soon as YouTube lets me upload stuff, because YouTube sucks. Uh, All the more reason to go to Rockfin. And here we are. If you want to support the show and keep this show on the tracks, join the Patreon and be grandfathered in. 
to whatever membership platform we go to next. I am going to sweeten the deal for those of you who have been with us from the beginning. But I'm sure just like YouTube, our days are numbered on Patreon. So join the Patreon, get grandfathered into whatever happens next. Because like I said, this is MFTIC 2.0, the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast 2.0. We've evolved and 3.0 is on the way. So thank you for being here and enjoy this conversation with Kent Woods and afterwards, Evan D. Dude, I'm excited to talk to you and get to know you a little better, and not just because you're a patron of mine, because I do want to thank you for that. I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. United mm-hmm. Crocodile, shout out. And, and yeah, brother, I mean, you know, we can take this wherever you want to go. I usually start off with, you know, asking you about when you woke up, when you realized, you know, maybe the world wasn't quite what you were told it was. And I saw in the notes you sent me that that's kind of a part of what you're prepared to discuss as well, right? So let's get into that, man. Tell us a little bit about yourself and and tell us about, you know, what what woke you up. Well, cool, man. Uh, Yeah, I'm 25, live in South Carolina. My name's Kent. But yeah, I'd say 2020 was like my actual quote unquote wake up year, which is kind of funny because I feel like I've learned like just so much in the past two years, man. Like. Don't get me wrong. I I feel like the first time I started getting into any conspiracy type stuff was probably around 12, like 13. We had YouTube so young. I remember those like FEMA camp videos that were like circulating everywhere. Mm. So like whenever I was 12, I remember seeing that shit and just like spooking, spooking myself out late night on YouTube. But like, I just kind of put it in the back of my mind from then on, like up until I'd say really 20, like late 2019. So like around that time I was, uh, super into like the Bernie uh, Sanders campaign (laughs) and like, same here, (laughs) just, yeah, just full on behind him. Just because he was, he was the only dude, like at that point I had had a little bit more of an awakening to how bad like corporate America can be and has been historically. And so I was kind of going down that like light, light rabbit hole. And Bernie Sanders was the only guy like kind of addressing that. So I got super, super into like the ideas of democratic socialism. And then just as I started seeing a repeat of 2016 happening out, like the same exact story almost in the primaries, I just started doing more and more research. And I think it was honestly like a Tim Dillon, like a Tim Dillon episode. He did like a live on YouTube and I just happened to catch it like late 2019 or early 2020 and he started like giving out all these names i think he said the devil's chessboard by david talbot carol quigley's tragedy and hope and these were like books i'd never really heard of but he was talking about them in this like grand conspiracy kind of way and that was honestly like the inception of me going through and figuring out like more of the serious levels to this yeah so i don't know if that's a good place to (laughs) yeah no and i i'm curious to ask you know when music came into that for you but i will say on the point of tim dylan i used to like his podcast i definitely recommend people i don't know if this is only available through his patreon because that there was a point where he took older episodes of his podcast it used to be called tim dylan is going to hell Right. That was probably what you, you on a gas digital. Yeah. And I was into it then because it was like the only gas digital podcast that was talking about conspiracy theories. And in all honesty, the only reason I signed up for gas digital was because a kid I went to high school with and was good friends with for from middle school to high school is Mm -hmm. on gas digital with Godfrey. So he's a comedian now and I want to, you know, support my old friend and see what he was up to and up like listening to Legion of Skanks and liking some of their stuff. But obviously as a (laughs) conspiracy, there we go. See, like attracts like, but when it comes to the conspiracy side of things, that was the only show if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And it's not with gas digital anymore. So I don't know what that says, but yeah, then they kind of took like a, a weird stance on COVID. So I stopped listening to Legion of Skanks as much because they, you know, they want to be so edgy, but then they're like not edgy about that. And it's just like, I, I just, I don't, can't get behind that, but let's not get too sorrowed on, uh, on <laughs> gas digital. Tell me about when music came into that. Cause you're, you know, obviously getting into some 
odd stuff on the internet like most of us did the fema camp stuff i remember those days when that was a big one especially when you know bush was in office because of the whole mm -hmm. hurricane katrina and then yeah, right um, around then right and then barack obama a lot of disasters while he was in office as well mm -hmm. but you know where did music come into it for you? Because for me, music was a big eye opener. A lot of the songs I was listening to back then helped me understand what the world was really about. Well, I started playing guitar right around uh, 12 as well. So kind of around the same time that I first started looking into, or at least getting on YouTube and finding these different videos. Actually, I started playing, it was like Guitar Hero that set me off on music at all, man. Like I, I, had my sister's hand-me-down iPod whenever I was like 10 and that was like my limitation to music whenever she was less, like chingy and stuff like that <laughs> <laughs> I remember so, those days <laughs> yeah man so like up until 11 I didn't really have any idea of like the music that I like but I'd always been like a musical kid like I'd done acting and like singing and, and I grew up in the church too so that like ties into later on like a spiritual kind of awakening moment but yeah I went to church every Sunday from like very young until maybe like preteens, you know, and then we kind of stopped going as much. But I started playing Guitar Hero because like my cousins and right around whenever I was 11. And then it just got to the point where I was like playing it so much. I had like the microphone set up on like, you know, ties hanging from my uh, ceiling fan and like playing on expert. And so I was like, at least they gave me an introduction in the music and like, you know, a wide range of different songs and genres and decades. So from there, I got my guitar and just immediately started like playing as much as I could and like using, I didn't take lessons. I just kind of like used YouTube tutorials to like teach myself how to play different songs I wanted to learn. And yeah, man, I think if you could call like the music programming, you know, kind of like all of the different stuff that you'll go through on your journey of like becoming somebody that likes music, just started going down you know, and, and that kind of took over anything else I was doing throughout like the end of high school even. So mm. right around the time that I started seeing any of these crazy videos, I didn't really give them much attention because that was also whenever I was getting into music and spending more time on that. Right. Well, and I, th I think there's totally a lot of honor in that. And I understand why a lot of musicians, you know, because I have a lot of friends that are musicians. I, I understand why they aren't so quick to like spend all their time learning about this stuff because, yeah, dude. you know, I was just listening to, and I, I mean, I think people should go back if they haven't heard this, this Chris Knowles interview on the Higher Side Chats where he talks about the song of the siren and he breaks okay. down how it weaves through all these different bands. And, and one thing that he said that really stuck out to me was like, you know, these entities, whoever they are, and this is all his theory, I really get behind it. These entities, they prefer influencing or possessing the lesser known artists, the artists that go and influence the really popular artists. So his mm -hmm. example of this is Elizabeth Frazier uh, and her group, the Cocktail Twins, which a lot of artists who, you know, Chris Bennington, or I'm sorry, no, Chester Bennington and Chris Cornell, you know, right. big, huge artists who say she was an influence and then ended up dying mysteriously. So there's a lot of dark alleyways and corners of the music industry for sure. So, oh, you yeah, know, man. I, I definitely think like when you're in it, you know, you might not, might not realize that. And when someone says it, you're almost like, Hey, fuck you. I, that's not my experience. But then there's right. the flip side of it. And I think you probably benefited from this. I mean, past guests on the show, Marty leads and all the gematria stuff, which you're familiar mm -hmm. with. There's right. something about music. When you learn the scales, when you learn the chords, when you learn all the different mathematical sort of things about music, mm -hmm. it has an effect on your mind. Would you agree with that? Like you kind of, like you get leveled up, so to speak. Do you agree with that? Absolutely, man. I mean, there was a, a time, you know, whenever I was going into high school where I'd say I was more atheistic, but like, even then I would still refer to playing live music as like manipulating the energy of a room. Like that's the only way that I really knew how to talk about it. Like whenever you're playing, especially, you know, live performance, like I was saying, you're kind of getting up and almost like orchestrating what's happening energetically in that, you know, room, venue, wherever you're at. And there was like never a point where I didn't see it or kind of feel it that way or understand it, I guess. Like as soon as I started playing live and, and getting a, I guess, an understanding of what was, you know, that dynamic, that's kind of how I saw it. I don't know if that answered the question right, but. <laughs> no, well, it, it kind of does. And it also leads us into maybe somewhere where we can go a little deeper, you know, the idea that 
music is used to, you know, manipulate in this mind control fashion really isn't, you know, to me, it sounds like it's a given like, well, yeah, music's going to affect people. It doesn't, that doesn't right. ma necessarily make it nefarious because, you know, there's music that inspires people and fills them with great feelings, just as equally as there might be dark music that fills people with negative feelings or even programs right. them to do negative things. Now, you know, on that point, you know, have you noticed there are certain artists like using certain instruments, like how deep does it go in that realm of like energy manipulation? Like, is that something the average musician is cognizant of, or do you think maybe you came to that awareness because of your other interests? I think that it definitely like more recently, I've, I've kind of had a better understanding of it that way for sure. I didn't really know how to describe it as well, other than like, you know, kind of a, a loose, terminology whenever I was talking about it but just essentially like what a DJ will do to keep everybody energized by playing like the next hit after the next hit and you can kind of just understand it on a scientific level and take it like you know very just physical without having any any real, real spiritual understanding to it right. but whenever I started to consider it that way it just opened it up in an entire new kind of realm I guess as far as like musicians in the grand scheme of things that go really nefarious with it like that's tough to say because there's definitely artists that I've like seen, dude, whenever I started going through like guys like Mark Devlin stuff where he actually goes through and kind of breaks down these different figures in the music industry, you do get it just a totally different, I guess that's probably why most musicians don't want to look into this stuff because it just, you know, it's, you have to break like all sense of idolatry through that process. And, and it's people that you've held up on a pedestal. And I'm not saying you have to like then in turn go and hate them or like not listen to the music anymore because I think that that's the wrong way to do it. But I don't know, for me, it's just like giving me a new perspective on what the industry might be as a whole, you know? Absolutely. I, I learned this, you know, through Santos about Led Zeppelin and all the symbolism and the mythology that they were playing on doesn't stop me one bit from enjoying and listening to Led Zeppelin. You know, I think, oh, yeah. I think you're making a great point. There are a lot of people who want to pretend like the sky is falling and they, you know, figured out, you know, exactly what's going to remedy everybody. And if you do right. what they say, you know, and that's just all fear mongering, you know, yes, some of these artists are up to some nefarious things and, and maybe there should be some real detective work going into this stuff and it shouldn't be like bloggers and whatnot and authors, but you yeah. know, that raises some question in itself about, you know, the government and detectives and the police forces and whatnot, but get without getting sidetracked into that. I think, you know, music like you put has that influence, especially live music. So they're mm -hmm. going to play on, subconscious archetypes that already vibe with people, right? They're not going to go and invent a whole new language. They're going to play on, you know, things that are already in the culture, things that are already in the language. Do you try to do this with your music at all? Tell us a little bit about your particular uh, style and, and let us know about your band too, where people can find that. While you're oh, at yeah, it. Thanks, dude. Well, yeah, the, the band's Heavy Honey. Uh, you guys can check it out wherever, like SoundCloud. Uh, we're not on Spotify yet. We're actually recording um, in the process of it. So that'll actually be out later on this summer. But uh, I'm sorry, man. What did you say before well, that last thing? Considering what you know, how much of that influence plays into what you do with your music? Do oh, you right. play on any of those archetypes or anything with what you're working on? Or maybe do you, do you plan on it in the future? I definitely plan on it. That's one thing that I'm trying to do right now is like, there's so much information that I've just like sucked in in the past two years that it's like, I'm having a hard time trying to, I guess, synthesize that down into, I like my writing style, I guess, is kind of more, I don't like to have, like go insanely deep with my lyrics. I'd like it if I could make it uh, a true statement that's pretty, you know, simple, I guess. I like more understandable language and I kind of uh, play around with that. But whenever I was writing my EP, that's actually the main thing that I've written and composed and put everything out for. I was really getting into philosophy at the time. So I would kind of listen to these long, like ph philosophical lectures and try to like take, you know, whatever I could understand from that and then break it down to the main points that I took from it and then try to put those elements into the song. I did that for a couple of the songs that I put out. Uh, and then one I've just made pretty obviously about like named it New Laws Coming. 
So it was like on its face, you know, mm. trying to just kind of forewarn, but it's also like melodically a very positive, uplifting kind of sounding song and a just darker subtext, I guess, if you kind of are into this research. And yeah, I mean, I'm actually starting to write. I'm trying to put together four more ones. I, I'm not a very like prolific uh, writer. Like I don't, you know, bust out new songs very often. So I've kind of been trying to hone down being able to perform the songs that I wrote, you know, back in 2020 and playing with the band ever since and haven't put much time to writing. But it's definitely something that I want to do with this next batch of four songs is just incorporate as much like Natural Law is one that I really want to go through and figure out a way to put that into like a three minute song. Mark Passio stuff on Natural Law. I'm trying to just figure out a good way to write, you know, that understanding into a song currently. There's a Larkin Rose video I really like called I'm Allowed to Rob You. I want to write like <laughs> some type of song with that as the understanding uh, or perspective, you know, somebody like singing at you saying they're allowed to rob you for these reasons. So yeah, it's definitely something that I'm interested in playing around with for sure. Yeah, I got to check that out. Larkin Rose, that sounds familiar. And Mark Passio, very familiar with him. Somebody, I think Chance, when I was on Chance's show just this past week, he mentioned Mark and said I should have him on the show. But yeah, for those who aren't aware, Mark Passio is allegedly, according to him, and I don't doubt what he says, an ex-secret society member. What secret mm -hmm. society? I forget. I don't know if he even says exactly. I think but it's the Church of Satan. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And, right. and that's, you know, again, going back to what I heard Chris Knowles talking about, you have these really... I don't want to pin them satanic because I don't, it is all satanic. I think there's a lot of panic around that term, but, but there clearly is this dark influence with certain bands that I wonder, you know, are they connected to secret societies? Has that come across your, uh, your mind at all? Or have you looked into that? Yeah, absolutely, man. I'm really fascinated by, especially now the kind of subgenre of like, I guess, SoundCloud rap that was out. And all of these different guys, I mean, it's it's like they're churning and burning them. I mean, I know it's like it's a dangerous thing. You know, a lot of people that are rapping, you can say like all of these, you know, murders that happen in the rap community are just like how it's been. But it seems like there's been a crazy influx on like these smaller time rappers, which goes back to what you were saying. It's like these smaller artists that never really go big, but they seem to influence a lot of people. There's a lot of artists out now, and I don't like to go too crazy conspiratorial with it because it can give you just this view of Hollywood and the music industry and the entertainment industry just as like a, you know, giant black hole. And, you know, there's definitely people that are organically just operating in this industry. It's too big for that not to be the case. But yeah, I mean, I was really into like, you know, they got like Suicide Boys, Ghost Mane, like all of these darker scream like rappers that were really heavy in uh, 2018, 2019. Yeah, I had never, uh, I'd never heard of those guys. Tell us a little bit of, more about them. The Suicide Boys, they're out of New Orleans, and they've got, like, I don't know if they, I actually haven't looked too far into, like, what they're putting out as far as, like, symbols and stuff. I mean, but their, their subtext is they rap about, like, killing themselves and cutting themselves and, like, overdosing and shit like that a lot. And at the time, whenever I was really, like, I was uh, drinking pretty heavily and just kind of like going through a dark little batch. This was back in like 2018, 2019. I would just like kind of, I don't know, I just gravitated towards that sound. And what the, the message that I took out of it was like, you're not the only person that might be feeling these darker themes, never really feeling suicidal myself, but just like having lost, I lost a brother to suicide. So I just enjoyed the fact that there was artists like talking about those subjects, I guess, at the time. Right. And going back now, it's like, it's a very, I mean, you can definitely see how it would not be beneficial for somebody in that mindset. It just kind of like entrenches you into that as almost like a culture of just like, uh, I don't know, low, low energy. You know what I mean? And yeah. uh, with guys like Ghostman specifically, not, I don't know the guy, I'm not saying anything about him. He raps about like Anton LaVey and more like these cult themes. He's got a lot of different like alchemical symbols and stuff like that. So you never know what people are playing with in their spare time. You know, they could be on the darker side, like I guess the left-hand path of things. But I mean, I, those symbols, like alchemical symbols, don't turn me away from listening to somebody, you know? Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, there's plenty of podcasts that have alchemical and occult symbols in yeah. them. And that's kind <laughs> of the the point, right? But right. I, I think when it comes to these darker themes, you can't, you can't always pin it on some sort of nefarious string pull, puller who's, you know, 
orchestrating these artists to do such and such. But, you know, in the case that certain researchers make, you know, it seems like, oh, well, you know, Elizabeth Frazier definitely was in the right place in the right time to get right. MK Ultra, right? So yeah. I can't, I don't know if we could say the same about the Suicide Boys or whatnot, but when it comes to rap culture, honestly, to me, it feels like, you know, and this might be a bold statement, but here we are on the My Family Thinks Some Crazy podcast. Oh, yeah. I think the, you know, rap music has a sort of programming into it that, yes, doesn't work on everybody, but for the susceptible group, it encourages destructive behavior. And we all know from this conspiratorial angle that, you know, uh, especially things like the Tuskegee experiment and uh, what they did after World War II, building great big highways, splitting up cities into different communities, you know, basically creating these places of impoverished, you know, disparity. And, you know, to me, it seems by design. So the rap music, you know, makes me think, oh, well, this is all by design too. But then again, it could be like part and parcel for what's already gone down in these communities, you know, and they're just creating sure. music, like you said, expressing something that is really honest. Like you had a pretty hard experience there, obviously losing a, a family member, losing a sibling. So I don't blame you for finding music like that. You know, you, at times when we're low, we want to connect with others because you're right, you're not alone, you know, at all. Right. And And sadly that does kind of spiral into something destructive for some people. But at the end of the day, you know, ultimately music is supposed to empower us, right? We want to, we want to feel empowered when we're listening to music. That's at least what I take away from it. But you know, what do I have to say? You know, I'm just a crazy old Mark over here. So I got to ask you, Ken, <laughs> you're, you're, you're looking in all this stuff. You only woke up sort of recently, but you, you have had your finger on the pulse. You've been kind of aware of things for a while. Does your family think you're crazy? Have you like expressed any of your, your opinions in the past few years before that? When did it start? I'd say it started summer of 2020. We like, we all, we hadn't, I, I was living at Charlotte or in Charlotte at the time with my girlfriend at the time, now my wife and congrats. Uh, we, thanks man. We met my family down in Charleston for like a little summer vacation kind of meetup. And as we were like staying in this little house together, I was just kind of going through all the research. At the time, all I was doing was like going through researchers like The Last American Vagabond. I started, you know, getting into Whitney Webb's research after Tim Dillon kind of put her on his show and going through just like these strictly factual current events type stuff and just getting lost in that. So I had, and, I, and I'm like a compulsive kind of guy. <laughs> like whenever I started feeling like the Bernie campaign was getting fucked over, I was just like on it, like until three in the morning researching these different things and links and who was getting funding from the most like pharmaceutical companies. And just like saving a million tabs. Then whenever I found um, T-Lab, I started, you know, really going through and compiling information to try to prove my case to people. And I was posting like crazy on my Facebook at the time. And just every day, a new thing, trying to compile information from T-Lab and just like share their links out. But also breaking it down because like I knew it was hard enough for me to get people to like even really interact with me on, in a positive light, like on these posts. So I would try to just give them the links and if they chose to go through and some people actually talk to me later on and they're like, yo, I looked into that. That's pretty fucking wild. But yeah, so that summer I was talking to them and I was just like, listen, it's a track trace database society coming at us like hardcore. You guys got to watch like trying to let my sister and her fiance at the time and they just weren't about it. They really didn't think it was the case. They were pretty pretty sold that, you know, COVID was that as it was being described, my dad was the only person that would hear me out. But then <laughs> I remember I had, uh, you know, we like, I talked to him some other time and just went through uh, as seriously as I could, like what I saw the future in like 2050 at the time, I had a pretty grim uh, outlook of everything. And so I just tried to spell that out for him as succinctly as possible. And, you know, he thought, well, that's a, that's a horrible way to think about the world and just like, wouldn't really go there with me, but he's at least like, he, you know, he listened to like Glenn Beck and all these like far, far right now guys, Same. you know, 
same Fox News dad. I know? had those same conversations with my dad. You know, it was, it was like, yeah. you know, he was kind of there and I would see what he was watching and be like, how do you not agree with me? But there's just some right. kind of like cognitive dissonance or something where they're just not willing yeah. to, to go, go with the idea that the government doesn't have their best intentions in mind. Yeah. Or even, you know, just that degree of separation from where it's like, well, it's not like this nefarious conspiracy. It's just like the failures of government. Right. Right. Uh, right. Right. And so there's just like an easy way to chalk it out for people that have just been like, especially watching and reading guys like Bill O'Reilly and people like these political theorists that are just like dressing it up with jargon and terminology right. that like, well, and that ultimately just confuses because that's where folks go they go well the system's broken we need someone else to fix it because i'm too busy yeah. with my nine to five and all the stuff i've done already you know so mm -hmm. i'll just make my vote count and then they end up going to these talking idiots to get their opinion informed you know and it's just yeah, yeah it's a vicious cycle that seems to be manipulated in my opinion you know and clearly yeah, you, you realize that i think podcasting has become uh, a great you know tool to inform and awaken i just wonder when they're gonna get a podcast that the geezers are gonna get behind when the boomers are gonna start listening to podcasts what's it gonna be i don't know man what's his name somebody uh, michael malice had him on recently and he was in turn on on his podcast. was it glenn beck possibly i can't remember but uh, you know a guy that was on fox news forever just like interacted with michael malice a couple of different times on like a long drawn out podcast so i was like that's awesome because oh. at this point i'd if i had to like pin down my kind of political ideology i'd say I'm, I'm much more aligned with just straight anarchy at this point and that's not to say just like we could go to that in the drop of a hat but i just have lost any faith in like a, a government or a governing system you know i kind of really i i like what mark passio has to say and guys like him have to say about the uh, government as a whole and so yeah i've, I've taken a far <laughs> far turn away from a democratic socialist mm. Yeah, I, I feel you, man. I luckily, you know, as much as I gravitated towards that stuff, I never like really committed to anything in that vein. Like I was uh, part of like citizens campaign for the environment, but I was in mm -hmm. it for a paycheck. Like I didn't really, you right. know, I didn't go too far with the political side of things. And I'm glad I didn't because in hindsight, a lot of those organizations seem a little suspicious and Right. And yeah, man, I, I definitely felt like I was a ping pong ball getting like knocked between being left and right. But ultimately, yeah. you know, I hope to make this like clear with the podcast is like, we're really anti-political. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm anti-establishment, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. my, my whole hopes with Trump and my disillusionment with Trump, you know, all came crashing down at the beginning of 2021 right. with everything that happened and i just kind of realized like oh my instincts were always right this freaking you know establishment is rigged and they're yeah. just playing both sides of it and it's you know it's a theater but you know that kind of brings us back to to music because you see these like musicians playing along in this massive theater with you know spectacles like the you know super bowl you see mm -hmm. you know the militarization of that whole process and then you have like all of these like you know grammy award shows and all these different places where it just feels like they're either you know creating uh, a separation in culture so that people fight with each other or they're just really they don't have their finger on the pulse of what people generally like like you're you're what i would call like an independent right musician right you're not part yeah. of a, a label or anything like that do you find that people who come to your shows are are like more interested in in like this kind of alternative space you know is there a real community behind independent music or is it the same people that would go to you know you know mainstream artists concert i think it's mostly the same people i mean the shows that we're playing right now i'm, I'm playing with my buddies in a band we've been playing together for a long time and we still do like covers we have about an hour and a half of original music that we'll put in but we have to intersperse it in between these other like pop hits that we can you know do we try to pick and choose stuff that we will enjoy playing but it's also stuff that we can appease a crowd with right and that's mainly just to keep getting employed because 
your options. Otherwise, I'm close to Savannah. That's pretty much the only city that I can drive and we play in pretty regularly. And, you know, we'll have friends that'll come out to see us play and we can get like maybe 20 people deep out of our friends occasionally for a good show. If it's somewhere like if we're playing in a more popular venue, especially. But as far as people coming out to see us specifically, it's really not a... Uh, I don't know. I don't know that the enthusiasm is as much there for people wanting to get involved in like a music scene like you used to see kind of uh, dominant in the culture. Right. And especially in bigger cities. I mean, I'm sure that still exists. So, you know, certainly Savannah has like an indie music scene. There's a couple of cool record shops and people like like the Wormholes is a really cool spot. And And you'll see like, you know, a lineup of indie bands. Some people have house shows, but as far as there being like this immediate kind of mechanism, I guess, for you to jump in as soon as you have a band, it's not really there, especially in places that are a little bit more rural, like like around here. Yeah, I like that DIY attitude. You know, I find that a lot of the artists that I get behind have that same approach. So yeah, I'm looking forward to to checking out your stuff, brother. I wish you had sent me that before. I know you sent Aether underscore or tell us a little yeah. bit about that is that your youtube channel what do you have going on there yeah so at a certain point i just felt like all right i'm learning so much i have to have like some type of outlet to to start putting these and i've made a couple of videos where i've played around with like being on camera on the microphone trying to like go through different things i've been researching excuse me and I don't know, that was just kind of an outlet for me to have because I didn't want to like just take up, you know, my Instagram that I have. I wanted to have that reserved for just like primarily stuff that I'm putting out with music and then maybe some stuff for like friends and family. And I wanted to have an outlet where I could be like more consistently putting out, you know, this, I guess, compiled information that I was doing. And there's no like general direction, I guess, that I have with either the, the YouTube channel or the um, Instagram channel. I just kind of, whatever I'm looking through at the time, I might be spurred to make a video in the moment. Like I made this video and I think it was back at the end of 2020 or just like at the beginning of 2021. And I took an excerpt of Mark Passio talking about occult indoctrination techniques. And it was from his uh, presentation. I think it's the cult of ultimate evil presentation. And so I took that and I was listening to it while I was like riding in the car. And then I was like, damn, this is pretty much exactly what they're doing to people with like, everybody's got to stay home and the mask and everything. And it almost seemed like whenever I really compared it, I was like, oh man, this is a wide scale cult indoctrination with like keeping you isolated, keeping you afraid, keeping like rigorous schedule manipulation. All, like you're exhausted. And so it was all these things. And so I tried to take that and break it down and just like use stock footage of like COVID stuff and made just like a little edit video with him talking in the background. And as that plays out, trying to get people like visually to tie the knot themselves. Cause I feel like that's the only way that you can really get people to wake up, I guess, if, if there was a technique, at least in my, you know, no, absolutely. Two years of experience. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just talking to uh, a guy, Donut, who has a, a very popular YouTube channel the donut mm -hmm. factory shout yeah, out that. yeah very cool guy and uh, he he said the exact same thing you know that you need this sort of visual medium to really express some of the ideas but going into some of the things that you've been researching you know not just the massive indoctrination as you put it I, I like that i think a lot of people have been talking about that lately it's pretty obvious with the masks you know yeah. masks have always been a part of rituals going back to even ancient times so you know, you're talking about secret societies in the notes you sent me. What have you been mm -hmm. looking into with secret societies? You said that there's something that unifies them together. Yeah, well, I'm really fascinated. Like the more that I look into them and I, you know, the more that you look into not just secret societies, but just like fraternal organizations, sororal organizations, I guess they could all be, you know, widely defined as secret societies, but just there just seem to be more and more unifying like elements. And it seems to me what I've like deduced from, you know, the research that I've done and two years on it, it granted I've, you know, standing on a bunch of people's work. So like what I've put together is not really anything that I've personally gone and dug in archives for. It's just seeing, you know, around the same time, if you even go back to just like the Adam Weisup story of him starting the Bavarian Illuminati, I think maybe that was in 1776. I can't remember exactly what time frame, but only a hundred years earlier, you had a guy named Sabatai V or Sabatai Zevi, and he was operating in kind of like the Turkish Ottoman Empire era. And that was in 1666. He proclaimed himself like the Messiah 
of kind of this, you know, his own huge, uh, for the story goes, he amassed like a million of uh, European and Middle Eastern Jews at the time into kind of this inversion of uh, the Kabbalah where they would just kind of specifically, uh, Robert Zephyr has a book on it. Well, let's, let's, let's give people a little bit of, you know, we'll take it from, from Wikipedia. So take it with a big grain of salt, but it says Sabbatai Zevi was a Sephardic Jewish mystic, an ordained rabbi from Smyma, Turkey. So, yep. And then got it there. And then who was active throughout the Ottoman empire? It says though, that in 1666 he was around so that puts him before adam weissop's time but i don't right. doubt that there's a connection or at least maybe an influence because you know a lot of that stuff from the you know ottoman empire and whatnot was very connected to everything going on with the bohemians in germany where adam was yeah, so I, I think the, what I think is the connection would is a guy named Jacob Frank, who's kind of I think the initial like founding of like the Frank man is it the Frank the Franken School? I can't remember. There's some educational organization, the Frankfurt Institute, maybe I, I can't remember. But Jacob Frank, I think, had some type of connection, certainly with different people that Adam Weissop was operating with. But there seems to be a connection with Jacob Frank and Adam Weissop. Okay, so I see what you're saying. So he he claims to be the reincarnation of Sabbatai right. Zevi. So that's where that connection comes in. And he's, yeah, he's definitely around during Adam Weishaupt's time. Cool. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. Keep going. So, yeah. So where was I? Yeah. So around that same time, they're both operating to start this, you know, network of, I guess, to me, it seems like almost a resurgence of whatever the, uh, the Jesuits were initially, whenever they started up, because they're an earlier organization. Okay. Um, but they seem to take a lot of influence. And I think Adam Weisop was a Jesuit as well. So his group um, was the Frankists. I think that's what you were Frankists. looking for before. So the mm -hmm. Frankists, and he was yeah. an influence on Adam Weisop. Mm -hmm. And there's still a, a sect of uh, Turkish people. I think, I don't know if this is a derogatory term or not, but it's the Donme is what I've seen them like referred to. And it's a people that still follow this kind of Frankist ideology or, you know, what Sabbatai Zevi started, which was this inversion, you know, the only way that you could become the closest to God is if you like found him in the lowest places. So it was like you had to invert his teachings and like go against everything they've, you know, you were told not to do. Mm -hmm. You know, they would they would do things opposite of what the, the Torah told them or all these different holy books. And there was a point where, you know, he was either, I think it was the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Emperor said, you know, he was either going to kill, he was meeting with uh, the Ottoman Emperor. And he said, he's either going to kill him or he's going to convert to Muslim and like denounce Judaism in front of every, all of his followers. And at this point he had amassed like at, at least a million people. I, I'd like to go back and I don't want to, you know, be incorrect about the numbers, but a large following. And uh, he did it point blank. He just converted to, to Islam, you know, that moment. And uh, what he told his followers later was that he would still practice all of their teachings in secret, but just to wear another religion as a mask essentially. And so this idea is very reoccurring in a lot of different things, even like just basic secret societies that we have nowadays in America of acting like this externally, you know, one thing, but also, you know, being very devout in your practice, you know, secretly. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking when you were bringing this up of someone I looked into recently who kind of did the same thing. His name is Theodore Roos, Albert Carl Theodore Roos, and he okay. basically participated in an attempt to revive the Bavarian Order of the Illuminati that Adam Weissup started when he was in England, and he was friends with a couple characters who were Rosicrucians and a part of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which we all know Crowley had some connections to and learned a lot of stuff from before starting his OTO group and and yeah they also practiced a masonic rite that came from emmanuel swedenborg and they use martinism which is ostensibly i think a part of christianity as their cover for this basically theosophical rosicrucianist uh weird kind of hermetic illuminati order what they accomplished i think is pretty it's pretty uh murky because there's a couple like military connections and the obviously, you know, Crowley and all that. So 
I'm still just getting into all this stuff. But yeah, I got to look into Sabotai, Zebby, Jacob, Frank, the Frankus. What else is there after that? I, I know whenever I started looking into the origins of Turkey gaining its independence, I found that I, I think it's Otto Turk. I can't remember exactly his name, but the, uh, the guy that's chalked up as being kind of the liberator of uh, Turkey. There's a picture of him doing the hidden hand symbol in front of his men. And he seemed at the time, I know he was very pronounced as whatever religion he was claiming to be, but there was also these, you know, in Turkey, these sects of, you know, people operating under the secret society kind of doctrine. I didn't word that properly, but so that was interesting to me. And I know, yeah. that unfortunately, like the story of Sabotai Zevi is where a lot of like, you know, your conspiracy theorists, quote unquote, will be out there blaming everything on the Jews. And I just saw like that never even occurred to me whenever I read this story. I was what I thought was like, oh, okay, well, this is just more like in 1666, that was the same year of the Great Fire of London. And it was around that same. So, I mean, all of these things are happening at the same time. So they, that was whenever the, the Pope was signing the Sestu AKV Act, I believe, in right. 1666, his kind of like claim of writ over the world, essentially. So you A lot of weird stuff happened around that time, even like fractional reserve banking has its roots in that time too. Right, right. I don't know. So whenever I saw that, it kind of just connect. I was like, how are these two or three events not like not share any relevancy? Like even if they weren't intentional, like they certainly have similar themes going to them, you know, just like this almost apocalyptic era of, of you know, human civilization. So that was really fascinating. And, you know, going through guys like Mark Passio's work pretty heavily and different researchers that uh, different people that claim they've been, you know, victims of like satanic ritual abuse. You see this connection of just like people that didn't operate. It wasn't just the satanic church. It was like there was doctors and lawyers and politicians and all of these people you wouldn't expect to be at these meetings. And they were all there operating together. And it almost seems to me that just being in a secret society, if you look at it statistically, there's statistics that show like most presidents, most, you know, businessmen, most of the Fortune 500 people, all of these really successful people are just statistically hired to be in a secret society or have passed even in a fraternal organization, if nothing else. But to me, that just provides a degree of separation from your basic society, you know, human population as a whole. And that's all they need to start bringing people higher and higher into the ranks. All they need is somebody just to like show a little bit of interest in a secret society in college. And then they'll take them from there and kind of, you know, if they're a person that thrives in what they're trying to get them to do, they can selectively lift them up into the higher and higher ranks. I kind of went off on a tangent there. <laughs> no, no, please keep going. And I wonder, you know, if this connects to what you were telling me in the notes there about, you know, certain, we'll call them like dictators, but particularly guys like Joseph Stalin and, and Adolf right. Hitler, who have done a lot of death and, and damage. And curiously, those same people that talk about, you know, the Jews do everything. They also tend to like get behind figures like that, like Hitler, yeah. you know? So it's, it's interesting. Like it, it's totally rocky rocky water you know like when you talk yeah. about this stuff so if anybody's out there listening just know that you know kent and i we're just armchair researchers here like we don't yeah. have any stake in this we're just talking about know. stuff that we've heard and we hope that people learn something that would make them you know go in and figure it out for themselves you know we're not right. we're definitely not making any conclusive statements about any group of people but just by talking about this stuff right so yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, and I, you know, no hate at all towards anyone for me personally. It's like even right. the people that we don't obviously are not fans of, I'm not out here like just preaching hate and, you know, constantly being down on them. But yeah, going back to, so just, and, and it, the thing that did it for me was like, okay, I see people wanting to pin it down on just like one group, like the Jesuits or like the Jews or, you know, different. Right. it's the Chinese, it's the CCP. And to me, it's like, it makes much more sense for it to be like an overarching kind of mechanism of a different factions working together as like a head of control center, you know, All, I mean, it's like an, um, the shape of an umbrella really defines it for me. It's like at the top. So you, you have, I mean, that's obvious. It's the shape of the triangle, but just like, I don't know, the more that I started researching secret societies, every single culture really has this phenomenon go through it. And it's really fascinating. I've been going through China a little bit more lately, and they had the White Lotus Society, which for the longest time under like the more dynasty kind of era of China, 
it was, you know, always the uh, lower class that was in these different sects of the, of the secret society, the, the white Lotus. And whenever you have guys like Mao Zedong rise to power, they're using their connection in this underground. I think with the secret society kind of network, if you look at it, he was actually going to a, a subsect of Harvard or Yale, a Yale actually that existed in China at the time. So Mao Zedong was a Yalesman, which is interesting to me. I think it's Yale. It could be Harvard, but an Ivy League school. And I wish I knew more kind of, you know, expound on that because that'd be interesting with your a connection to that whole area and, and your knowledge on it as well. Well, I'll tell you um, what, there definitely is a clear like Chinese connection. I mean, Yale is very much like, you know, they emphasize some of their British culture because there is like a British connection with Yale. And, and, you know, that's clearly a big part of both of those nations history is their relationship going to war, opium. And then we find out, you know, these secret societies might be connected to the drug trade somehow. So right. yeah, I think the connections are all there as far as China and Yale goes. It's, it's definitely, you know, you can see it well represented demographically even. Right. So, uh, yeah, so if it was, uh, you know, if there's uh, that much of it happening in another country and for so long historically, it just seems to me that this is just how power seems to open up the door to people that aren't born into some significant bloodline or some significant family. It opens up the door to just like your average person that's just being born to a, your, your basic family with no connection to anything. And it's a way to sift them back up into the system if they're really good at what they do. And I don't know. So that, to me, secret societies, I've just been battling with this idea. It's like, are they really, a, can they be a force for positive whenever they allow, you know, groups like who seems to be the dominating control groups of today, if it allows them to dominate so successfully so long, just an interesting thing to consider because you also have like the Russian um, revolution, the Bolshevik revolution seem to be driven by a, a secret society called the Black Hand. And then if you look at it, Stalin, Stalin, you catch him in a picture doing the hidden hand symbolism. He seems to have a connection to Freemasonry. And the Bernai Brith, which is now the Anti-Defamation League, which, you know, <laughs> got to be careful. But I think they have their roots as a, a uh, fraternal organization. And there was claims, there's a documentary that might be controversial, but I thought it was pretty interesting just for the fact that it shows this Masonic connection to America. And I'll have to, I'll send it to you if I find it, but it's, it outlined how Trotsky and Lenin were both uh, in this group of the Bernay Brith and it gave them this connection to people who are willing to finance them in New York. So you have like Coombs and Loeb, I think is the bank. Maybe you have them financing their travels and like their stay in different places like Russia at the time. And there's just this international connection to these guys that were operating even then you know, regardless of party affiliation, regardless of like state lines or country lines, nothing, none of that, none of that seems to matter. It's like all of this supersedes and they're allowed to operate on this more significant level. Right. Yeah. And for those who aren't familiar, Kuhn Loeb came up. I know about this because it came up in this book I've been reading, Empire of the Wheel. They talk oh, nice. about how they own all of these railway systems throughout the United States in the 1800s. Okay. So, you know, a lot of these nations had already established a connection to the United States in a big way, even before World War I and World War II. So we can't just say, you know, it's all Nazism because that's something right. that came much later than this sort of transnational elite connection. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm really fascinated right now with researchers looking into the Freemasons being possibly existing alongside of Native Americans and possibly even like Moorish people at the time. Because I recently found out that the Knights Templar could have been in uh, Nova Scotia as early as like 1458, I believe. And whenever I heard that and saw the comparison of like the, I'm sorry, do you know the, the, uh, the Kensington tribe? rune? Oh, so the, the Kensington runestone, I think is in New England. And that, I thought that's where you were going to go with that. And that's a runestone that maybe was left by Templars, but the tribe that was what? So there was a tribe that is um, supposedly like the first people to encounter the Knights Templars whenever they came over. And I wish I, I really, I did. But my problem is like, I'm really bad at like. Oh, the, the Micmac? Is it the Micmac? The Micmac. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think it's 1458. They're supposed to have touched, um, touched ground in Nova Scotia. And Nova Scotia apparently in Latin means New Scotland. 
And so that connection really makes sense if you look at it and it's like, all right, what are the possibilities that the Templars took their massive wealth at the time and they started operating with these people that were already kind of flourishing in uh, North America and using it to kind of build out their networks. And it almost seems like, especially if you look at, you know, like city layouts and city planning, it seems like obviously Freemasonry has had its roots from the earliest, you know, origins of this country. And it's almost like, did they just want to build a clean slate template and, and build their country from their ideals from the start? You know, it almost seems like that's what America has been historically. Absolutely. And I know, you know, you're listener of the show, you're supporter of the show. So I'm sure you've heard me talk ad nauseum about Ross Ben. So if yeah. you haven't picked up his book yet, <clears throat> Ah, excuse me. I'm drinking acai, and sometimes those little berries get like stuck yep. in your throat. Jeez, little seeds. Yeah. So, but Ross Ben's work on that is really fascinating. I myself haven't gotten through his book all the way, but it's definitely on my short list of books to finish. But yeah, man, I agreed. I think all of that's so fascinating. And you know, again, another person I talk about all the time, Michael Wan with our show, Your Handbook for the Apocalypse. Yeah, I've been enjoying his stuff lately. I was a guy that I was like just recently getting into from y'all's podcast. So. Yeah, well, I'm sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. There I'm you sure go. you know that all of that stuff is, is very much a part of Pennsylvania, but you know, that Mike can only research so much, you know, like he right. can only research so many areas and you yourself, you're down there on the 33rd degree in South Carolina. Just, so just shy of it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited to see, you know, as your research progresses, how you apply it to your local landscape. Have you looked into your local area much more than, than that yet? I, well, I just recently realized that I'm like two out, like an hour and a half north of Jekyll Island. So I'm really interested in like taking my wife out there one day to kind of like go out there. Yeah. And just kind of, I really like James Shelby Downer and Michael Hoffman's hypothesis of this like geographic, like research where you have to be in the location to really feel and understand, you know, to garner more information, I guess. I, I'm looking on my soundboard right now because I thought I downloaded a little bell noise. Cause we just have, we just had one of the most killer synchronicities of 2022. So we're going to do this one. We're going to go out with a fucking bang. So, so shout out to Joey Diaz. So I ordered Michael Hoffman's book on Amazon two nights ago, and I just got oh, a notification nice. before we got started that it's coming in the mail and it should be here tomorrow. So that's, that's, awesome. that's a synchronicity. And yeah, I agree, man. I mean, I'll tell you, I'm sure you might have heard me talk about this as well, but going to the Susquehanna River before I met Michael Wan, there was something that happened. And I talked about it with him when we first had our conversation, episode 20 something of the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast that you're listening to right now, folks. Thank you. And you too, the listeners out there, can get into this synchro mystic flow just like you put it. I didn't really realized that James Shelby Downard and Michael Hoffman had said that. And now I'm like, hmm, maybe that's why Michael Wan recommended Michael Hoffman's book to me. Cause that was one of the first things he did when we met, you know, we kind of like, oh, nice. you know, he showed me a couple of his books and whatnot, you know, cause I was just this wayward traveler and uh, stay in the night at his place. And, and he gave me like one of the Skymancy readings that he does where you know, and if you're listening and you haven't gotten one of those, definitely recommend it. But let's let's go back to to your area. I want to look this up and see because Jekyll Island is very interesting. A friend of the show, Slick Dissident, just put a cool photo in maybe our chat or a different Telegram chat. I forget which one. And he said that it was Yakim and Boaz, right? The two mm -hmm. pillars, right? And Yakim stood for Jekyll Island and Boaz stood for Bohemian Grove. I mean, think about wow. that. That's kind Dude, of a that's weird. Crazy. Yeah. I don't know yeah, where he got that killers. from, but definitely someone who would appreciate what we're talking about here. That's great, shout out man. to you, uh, slick, but yeah, this is, this is definitely, you know, South Carolina is an old state and, and especially, you know, with the coastline and the Native American history, I'm, I'm excited to see Star what forts, you get yeah. into. Star forts? Where are the star, star forts at? Just kind of, uh, spun, or just randomly, man, like my high school history teacher, 
like he, he my mom still works at that school i went to like a crazy small school like my graduating class was 27 people so like i went to a school of like 500 people for 14 grades like it was you know out in the sticks right and uh, but yeah he's he got in touch with her and just like randomly like gave me this book that he had he he like collects antiques and stuff like that and he's a really you know into history kind of guy but he gave me this book called architecture of charleston from 18 something until like 19, the late 1900s. And, you know, I'm working for my dad's architecture firm doing, I, I take like two dimensional plans and turn them into three dimensional like models in a software. And so I have been getting more and more into architecture as well. And especially like secrets in plain sight, st you know, stuff like that just blows my mind. And so, but I found recently looking through that book, I found I, I, I'm on stolenhistory.com. I think you've had the guy that started that on your podcast, maybe, or, or not, I'm, I, at least people that are like on there. I know they've referenced research on there, but sorry, somebody had made a post about Charleston and the earthquakes and destruction that has happened to that city. And it sits right on the 33rd uh, parallel. It's the easternmost city on the 33rd parallel. Okay. And so, oh, sorry, right, real quick, going back to the book. My teacher gave me that book, and in it, whenever I was looking through, I found an old picture of Fort Johnson or Fort Jackson that was right there in Charleston, and it was depicted as a star fort, and I had never really seen it as that before. I don't know if that fort still exists even, but, you know, I'm interested in going to that location and being, you know, looking to see if anything's still there. Yeah. Um, well, I found a picture of it, and it's definitely star fort. Yeah, uh, it looks like one. Yeah, I mean, it could it could be something out of context, but yeah, definitely. I mean, and then back to your point about stolenhistory.org. I don't, maybe I've had the person on, but they definitely didn't plug their website because I don't remember this. But have, did you find it though? Stolen yeah, I'm History? on it right now. Yeah. It's a cool website, man. People, Agreed. people post like good, good research on there. So like I took the, and it's kind of like a universal calling is like, you randomly got this book from your professor. Mm. This person has this really interesting post on the destruction of Charleston. And like, I just happen to have, there's a bunch of pictures in that book of like posts earthquake Charleston. And so you're looking through it and it's like similar, to like Dresden pictures of Dresden. If you look at the, you know, these cities that are like possible plasma events is what people have kind of postulated. And I'm really interested in those ideas as well. Now, for those who might not have heard of a plasma event, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, it's essentially like the earth has a, you know, electromagnetic field and it would receive such a blast from something happening in space. Like, you know, a CME is what people like to talk about that it would actually affect the electromagnetosphere of earth to cause essentially these random, you know, massive lightning events, I, I guess. And whenever you look at like how rivers kind of carved their way into, you know, into the land masses, it has this electric flow to it. And is that just like, you know, how energy seems to move throughout the universe because it's similar to like a tree's root system, mm. but it's, it's an interesting idea. And certainly stuff like that would correspond with like the mud flood idea where there's these, you know, earthquakes that are so rapid, it seems to like just melt layers of sand below the actual surface of the earth. Yeah. So all that stuff is really fascinating too, but it seems like Charleston may be a pretty big city for things like that happening. There's at least four massive destructive events that have occurred there. And, you know, it was destroyed during the Civil War, but interestingly enough, Savannah was not. It was spared. And Savannah has a lot of pirate history. So, yeah, there is a lot of, like, really cool stuff here in the low country of South Carolina to kind of explore firsthand, I guess. I'm excited about delving into it. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing here that Piedmont seems to be an interesting place, too, just for my mind, because the name Piedmont, Mound, Mont, and Mound are kind of similar. And some people say that, you know, yes, it could mean mountain, but it also could mean mound as well. Right. And then it says that there is a Paleozo Paleozoic metamorphic rock. And I like rocks, so that's interesting. Yep. But, but back to some of the stuff you pointed out. You've been looking into alchemy as well with this research, right? I mean, right. And then um, I oh, feel sorry, like, no, I, well, let's get into that. But I feel like uh, we, we might have dodged over your, your sort of spiritual experience. Should we get into that as well? Right. Yeah. I can, I can, uh, cause I, I too, I too felt that kind of atheistic vibe in my life. And it really, I think cannabis kind of brought me back to spirituality that maybe I, 
felt before I was born. Because for most of my mm. life, you know, I was just very like logical and and atheistic. You know, I don't know if yeah. it was culture or family or what it was, but did yeah. you kind of grow up going to church pretty regularly with your family? I did. Yes. Okay. Yeah, man. I think that there's a, I don't know, there's this, uh, seems to be a trend of that happening. Like mm. that was a lot of, that was the case with a lot of my friends. Not to say that we were all, you know, all of my friends were religious growing up, but, you know, growing up in a lot of Southern Baptists were around me. I, I grew up Methodist, but, you know, that was a little bit of an interesting, I don't know, relationship between the two of those. <laughs> right. Um, Baptists have a tendency to be a little bit more fire and brimstone, but like I was just going to church and feeling really bored. And like, I never, I felt it was more stifling and like kind of limiting. They were telling me exactly how it was and didn't seem to be too open to like, you know, questions, which was immediately a put off from like a young age. It almost seems like by design in hindsight, like yeah, man, you know, right. Roman Catholicism comes in many different flavors, but for me, it was very similar to how you're yeah. describing it. Boring, stifling, and, and people in my family were like, well, you just need to do it. That's why we right. do it. And I'm like, exactly. What? That's not a good enough reason. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, I have uh, definitely still not the most positive view of religion as a whole and probably like an unhealthily negative view of it just because of how I was raised. And not to say that I just have nothing but spite for it. Certainly, I think that it instills like a really cool sense of morality at an early age. But I don't know that that would necessarily be impossible to give a child without having this overtone of like judgment and, you know, limiting thought. And like, really, that's what I, I remember being terrified of, like thinking about things whenever I was a kid and just like, Gosh, I can't think about that, you know. And so just had a bad, you know, kind of experience from it. And I don't know, I, I started like really going against or not being into it whenever I was, you know, kind of around the same time, I guess 13, maybe preteen era. I was just like, all right, I'm kind of out. I mean, but I remember even being as young as like nine or 10 and uh, having these questions where I was like, all right, well, I get that like God or you know, Jesus like saved everybody. But if you don't know about him, like the Native Americans, we just came and wiped them out. And you're saying that they didn't even get a chance to know what was up. <laughs> and so like. I just saw that as like a really weird thing from an early age. Agreed. And yeah. Yeah. Just kind of immediately turned me off. Of, but the logical next step at the time was just like, all right, well, then every, like all religions are just a different flavor of the same bullshit. Right. Because so they don't give just, you any other option either. Like, I mean, they're right. as diverse or undiverse as it is. It seems like they in school, because it's secular, you know, they don't teach you about spiritual cultures of the world. They mm -hmm. just teach you about, you know, in my opinion, or at least from my perspective, they taught us a lot about war. <laughs> yeah, That's a lot of what we learned about when it came to other countries. But mm -hmm. for, for as far as spiritual cultures, I would have loved school if we were talking about, you know, spiritual cultures in other world or other places in the world, you know, mm -hmm. some of it is so fascinating, the mythology in, oh, yeah. in our Western, you know, world. It's so government focused that it's hard to appreciate it, I guess. Absolutely, man. That fact was really what brought me back. So whenever I, I remember going through back in 2020, whenever I was really digging through all of this stuff, I, I had a point where I was just getting really negative. I was just researching all of this horrible stuff and going through like what I think was the, were the legitimate information points of like, you know, what Pizzagate, I don't know if that's the best way to describe it, but you know, that whole ethos of right. research, you know, and it just was so, you know, I wasn't religious, so I didn't get in behind any of the Q stuff where it was more, not to say Q is a religious movement, but just like most of the people seemed to be right leaning, like Christian people. And that was behind a lot of like that energy. So I didn't get in to really any of that. And yeah, it just got super down on kind of my outlook on, on the world. And at the time I just stopped drinking too. So it was like, I should have been in this more healthy state, but I stopped because I was just becoming like a destructive blackout drunk. And yeah, it, it, it I don't know. So I just, I had a point, I guess, where I just came to this break where I was like, all right, if there is something like greater out there that I can contact in a moment, like, you know, what can I do about all of this stuff that I'm like looking up? Like, is there anything I can do to help? Cause it just seems really bleak and like seem to have a thought in that moment where it was as above, so below, which is a term that I'd heard before, but it was almost like that thought just randomly popped into my head again for some reason. And I was just like, all right. And I just kind of like 
typed it into YouTube just to see what popped up. And it was Santos Bonacci giving a lecture on his understanding of as above, so below. And I remember just like, you know, being at this point where I was just like, I'm just interested in like whatever I can get from this experience that's happening. But it was yeah, a moment where I was like, once I thought had that come into my head, I felt like this just deeper connection than I'd ever really felt before. It almost like just brought a tear to my eye. And so whenever I was looking it up and understanding what Santos was talking about, it was just like this. He basically goes into the idea that just like we're in an infinite repeating loop and like, you know, everything is going to eventually equalize. Even if it's really bleak now, it's going to be better later. And that's just going to keep happening. And whenever I was thinking about that, it just brought me this like really great sense of peace and ease that I had never really had before. And it seemed more religious than like any experience I had ever had in a church. And it was only with me and like my interpretation of some person's work on YouTube. So it was like this really beautiful moment. And like genuinely from that point on, I haven't really like had a moment where I'm not at least considering that as uh, the dominant fact, uh, or I guess my understanding of our reality where there's some, not necessarily... I don't think of it as like a, you know, like a father figure necessarily, but some greater force that is operating and creating, you know. Right. No. And I love that you brought that up because I think the seven hermetic laws are so connected to my story as well. I mean, I can't pin the exact moment, but I remember buying the the book somewhere, probably like at a used book store. No, you know what? It had to be online because it's one of these like straight to print books. But anyways, I ended up giving that book to Sam Tripoli and that kind of got me on his show, his Patreon show. And, nice. and thus where I'm at now kind of follows. But yeah, for those who might not have that off the top of their head, the principle of mentalism, the principle of correspondence, the principle of vibration, the principle of polarity, the principle of rhythm, the principle of cause and effect, and the principle of gender. And as above, so below, I think goes into correspondence. That would be the, the same one, right? Yeah, so yeah. correspondence. And this principle embodies the truth that there is always a correspondence between the life and phenomena of the various planes of being in life. The old hermetic axiom ran in these words, as above, so below, as below, so above. And the grasping of this principle gives ones the means of solving many a dark paradox and hidden secrets of nature. There are planes beyond our knowing, but when we apply the principle of correspondence to them, we are able to understand much that we would otherwise uh, not be able to know. This principle is of universal application and manifestation. It's interesting. This comes from the Kabalian.org. Very cool. Oh, okay. But uh, but yeah, I, I love that that was so inspiring because I remember, you know, having very similar experiences. Yes, I was high smoking weed, so I probably, <laughs> you know, attributed a lot of it to smoking weed. But for whatever reason, when I smoked, I got very interested in all the same things that Santos talks about. And it was, as you said, like a very spiritual experience, unlike anything I'd felt in church, you know, and mm -hmm. and that moved me forward in a way where I'm like, well, you know, I can help people understand this stuff somehow. Right. And that right. could be part of what I do. And I think that's uh, a thought that eventually manifested into this podcast somehow. But oh, man. But yeah, I think that it brings people to conclusion that, oh, there is so much to still know. And one of these topics that I know we're both very interested in is alchemy. I kind of mentioned it before, but you brought up oh, yeah. in the notes how the number 56 and 65 are connected to the philosopher's stone. Let's get into that a little bit. Yeah, man, I actually put together like a little presentation thing. We can flip through. I don't have to like go into it too deep, but if you're interested, I could throw it up on the screen just to flip through it for you. Absolutely. Because I was just trying to syncretize like a bunch of the information that I liked. I was going through Gematra pretty heavy and I still think that it's, my view on it is that it's like a vital like piece of occult knowledge to kind of have an understanding of, but people do have a tendency to take it into this place where it's unhelpful. So I'm not, I'm just going to say that, but yeah, man, let me, let me know whenever it's kind of good to go. Now, before you, before you get into that, <clears throat> clarify on that last point, I want to know what you mean oh, yeah. by, by so when it can be unhelpful. 
Oh, uh, so, I mean, the, well, for the reason that I think that it's pretty important is because if you look, it's all of these priest class, the same people that were really writing our language and creating our calendar system. And there's a book called The Esoteric Origins of the Alphabet that goes into like kind of how that was uh, all worked together. And so it seems to just have this undeniable pre-planning into our system of knowledge. And I think to say that it has no like use in kind of, you know, decoding messages that might be going on within the occult is maybe a little bit limiting, but also there is an easy, you know, you can punch in uh, a number and go through J the Gematrinator website and you'll see a bunch of phrases or names and you can just go through those and like until one that lines up with what you're trying to say, or here's a perfect example. So like Kent Woods music is how like, that's my YouTube, my Instagram, like all of my stuff. And if you use Gematrinator and just type in Kent Woods music, and then Society of Jesus, they have the exact same <laughs> gematria in like all of the four main ciphers. So like early on, whenever I was getting into gematria, I was like, all right, that seems like such a coincidence that maybe this is all bullshit. But then I keep digging into it and I'm just like, all right, no, that's just like the weirdest coincidence that, that could have happened with me being interested in this research. And I think that if anything, it was like kind of a synchronicity that told me like, okay, you have to overlook like some of this. This isn't a dead giveaway. You can't be like that person into their video at like 133. Oh shit. And you also, I think it's unhelpful to like punch in phrases until it's, you know, comes to some and use all these different ciphers until it comes to some final conclusion. It's just people can write their own narrative really easily. And I've been guilty of it in the research myself. Yeah. Um, I think that's why Gematria as interesting as it is. It doesn't always like make for, you know, a great case for something because unfortunately so many people bring their own theory mixed in with gematria that maybe yeah. you know the mistakes that they make aren't obvious and then people think you know certain numbers mean one thing and then it goes and it's like totally different if you do the math so i see right. what you mean there is a lot of like fudging the numbers possibly going on or people just yeah. reading too far into something Mm -hmm. Or just, yeah, or taking it to, but I mean, I really did. I think uh, Zach Hubbard, people probably know him if they know Gematria. He's like the best guy I've seen on putting out how it relates to like current events and news. And he's also done really good research as far as like, if you're trying to see how this is being encoded into different things in pop culture. Now, is every single example he's ever given, like obviously something, well, I mean, it's not going to sell every person, which is why you know, I, I, he gets into like the sports stuff and I, I can't really follow it as much because I have no like understanding of sports in general. So uh, uh, same here. <laughs> yeah. But not, not to comment on any, like there's just people that like, I think use it well to point out information that is seemingly valid or, or just obviously important. And whenever I was going through his research, he was finding all of these 56 connections, the number 56 and how that's you know, society of Jesus equals 56 in one of the ciphers. And I try to stick with just the four ciphers that that website gives you if I am going to look into this stuff. But this might actually be a good time to pull up this image. I have like a list of all the things that he had found during 2020 that were like really important to what was going on with the narrative for COVID and the number 56, you know, kind of encoded in all that. So Society of Jesus is 56. Black Lives Matter is 56. You want to share the screen? Do you have a... Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, man. Worries. Let's see... Multiple. I just go, how do I do that? Sorry, man. I don't really use uh, Zoom too often. No worries. There should be a button down at the bottom, or you can hit Alt S on your keypad and it will, or your keyboard, and, and that should work. Oh, here we go. Nice. So, yeah. Can you see that now? Yep. Oh, very cool. Yeah. So yeah, this is just a, a list that I threw together, just kind of show the relation or at least how many different words I was finding that seemed to have a correlation to what was going on in 2020. And Zach Hubbard, you know, most of the numbers that I've seen here, and that's what's spun me off, but it went in a different direction than I was thinking initially, because for a while I was just using this as a way to associate things with the Society of Jesus exclusively. Okay. The number just seems to have a little bit more significance after watching Scott Onstad secrets in plain sight. So yeah, I mean, let's see some of these words I just threw in there just because they were interesting. They weren't necessarily about uh, like Freemasons is 56, but it's in a different cipher than the ones that were, you know, kind of contiguous with the 2020 theme, right? Coronavirus 56. So, I mean, 
he did some pretty interesting work on that. And I found, uh, you know, I found this article that said the 27 club is a myth and 56 is the bum note for musicians. And it, if you see this graph, that's, that blue number is 56 and 27 is down here. And that's just like the rate of which musicians and popular musicians, I think they, they did a statistical analysis on this article that I found. And I was like, wow, that's pretty interesting. And he gets in Zach Hubbard work or his work deals a lot with like these sacrifices that seem to go on in the music industry. Right. And uh, I find that interesting whenever you look at how many people are dying at these like occult numbers of significance in 56 seemingly to be one of the most as far as of you know alchemical theme goes do you want me to kind of tie it tie it into that uh, sure. with this so like this is all from uh secrets in plain sight if you guys are interested it's like a three-hour documentary but i just took excerpts for, that were you know relating to this so like the washington monument is 6660 inches and that equates to 555 feet the you know Pyramidian at the top is 55.5 feet, and that's 666 inches. This is interesting. He was going into, the Scott Onstott was going into how the the kind of o Osiris Horus myth, I'm sorry, I'm trying to like <laughs> stay on it, but so what he was saying is the- We're the looking at the, the Washington Monument here with Vesca Pisces, right? Oh, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he was saying that if you take the two, there's two overlapping circles forming a vesica Pisces around the Washington Monument. If you take uh, those two circles and assume that they equal the, the height of the Washington Monument, the, the height of the Great Pyramid can be found I exactly in the parameters of the vesica Pisces formed. Right. So um, where the two circles intersect, that creates the height for the pyramid. And then right. one of the circles height is equivalent to the obelisk itself. So, wow, yeah, that's that's really interesting. And the numbers there are significant, I'm sure, with 56. Yeah, well, I just found that the relationship that they express where it's like, okay, 6,000, you know, that right. inches five, five, equals. Five. Yep. So, and this is what uh, he kind of like digs into throughout that uh, documentary. But one thing that he said was interesting was the circles forming the Visca Pisces can represent Osiris, or sorry, yeah, Osiris and Isis okay. merging together to birth the sun god Horus. And if you look at, you know, a, an obelisk just as a giant a sundial and then hours Horus, it kind of like works out. Another thing that ties that in is the Vesca Pisces in this piece of artwork at the, at the UN Security Council. It says the mural at the center of the UN Security Council chamber echoes the symbolism as it portrays Adam and Eve, original sin, and the conception of their firstborn son Cain, all within a Vesca Pisces. And so that seems to be a similar story, especially with guys like Santos who like syncretize all of this, you know, kind of religious subtext together. The, the wing disc of Horus is above the, uh, the elevator shaft inside the Washington monument. And that same, uh, symbol can be found on this Egyptian obelisk in Schwal uh, Schwaller de Lubix has a study where he shows the relationship to six and five in the proportions of this obelisk. And so that all just kind of seemed to tie together in a really interesting way. Whenever you're considering these numbers, you know, the pentagram itself uh, seems to encode some pretty important information. Sorry, man, I don't want to get too tied up. With no, that. no, no, this is great. When go back to that last slide. Oh yeah. See that really quick. Okay. There's a golden ratio and obviously the Pentagon Another big building considering, you know, not just the occult significance of the name and the shape, but also its function in society and in our country. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, it's location probably, if I'm not mistaken. And this is just another relationship in the documentary. He drives home like the relationship between the Washington Monument to the proportions of the Great Pyramid in a bunch of different ways. Right. And then if you get into some sacred geometry, sorry, man, excuse me, Albrecht Durer has a quote that says everything stems from the Vesca Pisces. And so that's just interesting on top of, you know, the observation of the two overlapping circles near the Washington Monument. Another example is in Melancholia One by Albrecht Durer. He seems to have encoded the, uh, the pentagon or sorry, the pentagram and the, is it sexagon? Septagon? Uh, the six-sided. Hexagon. Shape. Hexagon, yeah, hexagon and pentagon together 
in uh, the proportions of this piece of artwork in Rinley Chateau in the geographical like points of significance near that kind of phenomenon or not phenomenon, but anomaly in uh, France. Rinley Chateau seems to have a, a lot of important alchemical significance. I think there's some, a series of alchemical texts that were found there. I really haven't done, Howdy Makovsky does really great work on Rinley, probably the best work that I've seen on this subject, but I haven't gone into his work on it yet. Cool. Thanks um, for the heads up. I'm having him on the show soon. Yeah, I thought that's what you were saying on an episode recently. So I was like, nice, that'll be cool. Right on. He, he does great work, man. This is DC. It's showing kind of that similar relationship between five and six in different points of significance. How he chose to map these out, I'm not sure, but I just thought it was another interesting example. And then it actually is encoded in what they say is the, uh, the Earth's processional cycle measured in years divided by the Earth's equatorial circumference measured in nautical miles is precisely equal to six and divided by five or six over five. I'm not very mathematical minded, but it's just stuff like this that all like tells me, all right, this is encoded in a lot of this esoteric information. Right. And you know, it, it made me, it caught my attention whenever I was watching the documentary, cause I had already had in mind the, the use of 56 and, you know, kind of like what was going on with the, I don't know, the current events in Gematria at the time. And so with all of this information, it just seemed to have like a really important bit of significance that I didn't really understand. It was kind of frustrating me. So I was just like trying to think. And whenever I found the secrets in plain sight, Scott Onsides explains that he sees the relationship from six and five, the relationship between the macrocosm and the microcosm, which goes back into that, you know, rule of hermeticism that you were talking about a second ago. And it also ties back into like the alchemical idea of the philosopher's stone. Right. It seems to be, I have this, or I found this really cool breakdown that uh, Mark Passio gave on an episode of his podcast. And it kind of, kind of tied it all together for what I was thinking, because if 56 or 65 kind of expresses that same relationship numerically, then symbolically it's often expressed in, in an alchemical uh, text as the philosopher's stone, you know, with that symbol. Yeah. Sorry. I'm, that's pretty much the only, uh, the yeah. last slide I had for that one. No need to apologize, man. This is great stuff. I think the Vesica Pisces and its connection to all this, like for those who aren't, you know, watching the visual slides, definitely go to Rockfin or Patreon to check that out. But the point being is that these numbers connect to quite literally the little, you know, everything that makes up our universe from the littlest things to the biggest things. You know, we're talking about the Vesca Pisces. This is sacred geometry. You know, when you look at the way an egg forms, you know, into a creature, whether it's, you know, frog or whether it's a human being, you know, there's this cell division that takes place that's just like that Vesca Pisces. So yeah, it's absolutely, I think, fundamental. And that's kind of the point I was gleaming towards when I asked you about music and learning music and how it kind of encodes this number magic into your skill set in a sort of subconscious way because you're aware of how these you know notes which are again represented by numbers as well as qualities and the way they sound to us you know you you can kind of understand the relationships of numbers better as a musician i think yeah i mean a lot of like the best composers are certainly great like mathematic minds as well right. i i honestly man like i never picked up i took like maybe three or four different theory lessons and i just never it never like i don't know sank in i guess i have like a general understanding and I've been playing now for 13 years uh, since I was 12, I'm 25. Yeah. And so I've been playing for long enough now that like I can hear notes and just kind of hear chords, um, easily enough to where that's kind of how I play and write. But I've had people tell me in the past, like math is absolutely the core of music and, and the more research that I do that just, you know, resounds more and more, especially whenever I was getting into stuff like cymatics and that was blowing my mind, especially as somebody that's always appreciated how frequency and like sound affects you anyway. I'm really susceptible to like getting like chills from like really good music. So. Right on brother. I love it. Now I'm wondering, you know, how that connects to like in particular, in particular with music, you know, fourth 132 Hertz, right? Have you heard oh, about right this and how they you mentioned mark devlin earlier and how you know 
he was talking about the different backstories of different artists, but I know Mark Devlin also talks about this kind of time in history where they changed everything from 432 hertz to 440 right. hertz. Have you looked into yeah. this at all? Well, 440, 44 is like, I think in Japanese, four is how like the word for death. 44 seems to have like this dark undertone in esoteric knowledge. 44 is like kill, murder. Like I am i don't want to, you know, misspeak, but if you look up that kind of stream of thought and those words into the Jamatronator, you'll get 44 a lot, 44 and 83. But that seemed to be, that was what, you know, I thought of whenever I first learned that, that 440 was like a negative kind of discordant tuning that everything or frequency rather that everything had been set to be played at. And I certainly, I've played around with tuning my guitar to what, you know, like a video told me was 432. And I felt like it had a really interesting resonance that sounded like significant, but I was like, I didn't play around with it enough to know whether that was me kind of projecting what I wanted to happen through the experience or not. Right. There's all these videos on YouTube of comparing the two. And I think it's like no question things that were in a better frequency than 440 because they've showed with cymatic imagery that 440 doesn't provide any like significance of sacred geometry. And it's kind of just like this blur versus 432 that does uh, seem to register these like really pretty sacred ge geometrical patterns. Uh, and a lot of the times they're similar to what, you know, are, is depicted in these church window panes so that kind of ties us into that stuff wow I, I love hearing that you play around with it and i i hope that more artists like learn about this and play around with it too and maybe even mm -hmm. make music in that tune because i think you know bob marley led zeppelin there's a couple groups that i researched when i was searching around about this that i heard used 432 hertz for some of their albums and if you get the vinyl of that music then you can hear it in 432 hertz but i wonder like if it's digital like i'm so like you said you didn't take music theory classes like i didn't even really know that existed like so <laughs> you know i'm really in the dark when it comes to the terminology here but i do understand what you're saying with the sacred geometry and as like a mm -hmm. a listener you know i prefer kind of headphones and i don't go to a lot of live music events uh, i used to you know when before covid happened i was kind of getting into it you know yeah but quite honestly when i was younger i always felt like that blur that you just described like it, it like listening to really loud music just blurred my mind out and yeah. I wonder if they had been tuned into 40, 432 hertz, maybe I would have had a, a different experience. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, I've never been to a music festival. Like I've only, my experience with live music has predominantly been just small time shows that I've wanted to go see for bands and, and then me playing live music in bars and, and, you know, these different small time music venues and, and like dive bars and places like that but yeah i i'm sorry i've lost my train of thought <laughs> that's all right uh, we're, we're into our uh second hour here ladies and gentlemen we're smoking a little smoke getting high <laughs> yeah <laughs> my man ken over here had a blunt i had a blunt going i was thinking Thank about you, rolling another one but yeah this I is a, i had another one but i was like man i don't want to be like i'm already a super add kind of guy but, you know i actually Whenever I was getting into like the spirituality stuff, that was whenever I stopped taking Concerta. I'd been on it for like 12 years. It was wild, man. Uh, very, very negative drug. I wouldn't say, you know, recommend other people just quit cold turkey, but I've seen nothing but like a benefit since stopping. It's a it Concerta is essentially Adderall. And I've been on it just since I was a really young kid. And I think as far as doing anything to help me retain my memory and stay focused, it did not in a long term way, you know, it's just kind of like, enabling you along and along i guess yeah sorry to go off on a different no tangent. no no that's not a, that's not a, a unwelcome tangent at all i think that's uh really you know i'm glad you mentioned that because that's something that you know maybe there's other people who are listening who are like oh yeah maybe maybe that'll help them because i certainly can't get behind any pharmaceuticals i don't know what would have happened to me if i had taken <laughs> any and i'm glad i did i have yeah, parents man. who never like put me in that situation but you know i'm glad to hear that that, that helped you because yeah adderall i mean some people say it's like a type of of meth i don't know how true that is but it's i mean it, no i mean it sucks man like whenever you're a kid just like getting told that you need it to get like to do halfway good you know well in school i was well, pretty much a c student like all throughout high school and so 
Yeah, I mean, it's it definitely gives you this zombified zone that you get in and you can definitely get things done, but it's just like having that every day for the most part for so long in your system has got to, you know, it just does something to your long-term ability to have an attention span and still kind of struggle like, you know, actually making myself dig into a book. So a lot of the information that I do is like through videos and stuff like that, but I want to get better at that. So I was like, if I keep taking this, it's never going to give me the ability to do it by myself, I guess, was my kind of bottom line. So, right. Well, I'm yeah. glad to hear you made that decision, man. Yeah. I mean, I'm biased because I try to be as organic and, and natural as possible. And, and that didn't yeah. like, that wasn't always the case. You know, I used to eat like junk food and all kinds of like, you know, stupid shit. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that honestly probably gave me a little bit of ADD there, you know, and, oh, yeah. and especially Totino's. the television, you know, it Totino's pizza rolls. <laughs> yes, I, <remember. laughs> I used to eat pizza rolls too. Bro. Yeah. And, but television too, kind of puts you in that sort of state. And I remember, you know, yeah being like the oldest of two siblings, having a younger sister, I just always kind of, you know, vibed being by myself. And unfortunately TV was like a, an easy, like comfortable thing to do. And I feel like, you know, huh, maybe I wouldn't have wasted all those years without it, but either way, you know, here we are making improvements in our life. And like you yeah. said, you know, when you drop that out of your life, cold Turkey, you saw something whether it was a connection to higher power, whether it was a connection to your higher self, you know, you said you're not very religious, but I tend to think that that was a big part of me becoming more spiritually inclined. You know, I don't think it's any religion in particular that I follow, but there's definitely like, I would say my intuition that I follow mm -hmm. and it guides me towards different outlets of information, you know? Yeah, absolutely. No, I really appreciate your outlook and, and kind of how you go into synchronicities because that was one thing that like whenever I was having that moment where I was getting into Santos Bonacci and like having a departure from just straight negativity and like that kind of conspiracy research, it had that turn like Sam Tripoli says a lot where it's like you do get to a point where you're like, well, these people consider this stuff and they venerate this stuff so heavily. Like why I, I'm like disconnected from it entirely thinking that like there is nothing behind this existence at all. And so that's why alchemy is as like, I'm not, you know, totally well versed. Obviously it's a really deep like s subset of information and it goes in all, pretty much everything. It's like seem seemingly a pretty holistic set of information. And I've only gleaned like little points here and there, but like that as an explanation and then different hermetic principles, it, it just makes so much more sense intuitively to me as like kind of a, I don't know underlying defining rule for the our existence i guess is a way to put it absolutely um, yeah no that's kind of where i've always leaned towards certain books have kind of posited that but you know a lot of great folks like you mentioned today mark passio santos bonacci mm -hmm. they kind of help you paint this picture and maybe even give you some pieces to this puzzle that you know you can't quite fit them all together but when you learn about <clears throat> alchemy and I think mm -hmm. we even touched on this, you know, a little bit. You mentioned James Shelby Downard, but like this idea of like the Masonic theater, I, me I, I know he right. mentioned that. And I always wondered like how big music acts, you know, fit into that, especially, you know, that's a huge talking point in this community, all the symbolism and esoteric stuff that goes into it. Because, oh, you know, man. in my town, there is like a, a festival that would happen every year and, you know, I remember the Blue Oyster Cult came and that was like the biggest band that would come at least in the time that I was around there right. and, and go into it every year. And and like I said before, the loud kind of festival vibe just didn't sit right with me. But right. now I wonder in the context of everything I've been learning about my local area and the Native American history and how this place was kind of like treasured for its oysters and sacred to them. And now they have mm -hmm. this rock festival every August. I, you know, I just wonder what the implications of that are. I mean, we can't go and say every small town is is doing this kind of occult magic, but right. you know, it is. It does make you wonder. Absolutely, man. Interestingly enough, you're talking about big name artists and how they operate within Freemasonry potentially. Here's a. My, this is like my first tattoo. Okay. It's a Jack White tattoo. Sorry. One sec. Jack. So like whenever I was first getting into playing guitar, I was really big into the White Stripes and it was actually 
like my favorite band for the longest time. And I kind of like, by the time I got the tattoo, I wasn't as big into Jack White and the White Stripes, but I was like, that was my inspiration for kind of like starting to play the guitar. Right. And I also have another tattoo that has like a little deeper meaning. So that three kind of tied in without me knowing anything about like a Masonic connection to the number. I didn't even know Jack White could be connected, but since I've done like a lot of research and both of his parents worked for like the Roman Archdiocese of Detroit, like the Detroit Catholic Church. I think his mom actually worked for the Masonic Hall in Detroit as well. That's like just on his Wikipedia or her Wikipedia. That's interesting. There was a, a part in the book I was reading, Empire of the Wheel, where Aleister Crowley has this dispute with the Freemasons in Detroit. And it's mm -hmm. over this like ritual that they wanted to, you know, learn from him, or I guess he found out they already knew it and he was upset about it, but it was called the blue equinox ritual. So huh. there's a lot of strange stuff going on in Detroit. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And I am like, I mean, clearly Jack White actually donated like 150 grand to that same Masonic Lodge, like recently in 2018 or something. He's been interviewed by uh, Buzz Aldrin, 33rd degree Freemason. And there seems to be this connection between like maybe Catholicism or Jesuitism and, and Freemasonry that, you know, I can't remember the school, but I just recently learned about this little mascot figure called the Bellican. And it's like a mascot for this Jesuit school. And it's also like a significant little icon or icon for a subsect of Freemasonry called the, the Jesters or something to that effect. I'm uh, looking it up right now. Is it spelled B E L I K E N? Yeah. Huh. It's a pretty interesting little story, but it'll tell you it's like this is for a mascot for a Jesuit school, but it also has this connection to this Freemasonry subsect. And so I was just, that, that kind of goes back into the secret societies all having this like higher connection, you know? Yeah. It says the St. Louis university mascot is more than a mascot. It's a bizarre munchkin figure <laughs> that has a history that dates back to the early 20th, early 20th century. Interesting. The Bellican. Yeah. It says it, it connects to like. They're saying maybe this is, yeah, it says it's connecting to like a trickster Buddha. Maybe this is like a diversion. You're saying that it has something to do with Freemasonry, but I mean, well, the I'm Jesuits, they are in, they are in Asia as well. It's not. Yeah. Aren't um, fetched. Just a, that was an interesting little thing. I think it's their, they're the mascot for the Jesters, which is like a higher degree of Freemason, like a right. large subsect club well, that you can get, you join into if you're a Freemason. It's just like a interesting kind of tie between the two. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. No, I don't doubt it. That's yeah. The Billiken. Huh. I mean, yeah, this website that I'm looking on is not like the, you know, bastion of all truth, you know, right. uh, <laughs> there might be for some, sure. there might be some things they're leaving out for better or worse or intentional or not, but yeah, it's definitely a weird Asian, like uh Buddha trickster Buddha, but I never heard of this before, but the trickster, you know, is definitely something that I've been talking about and learning about a lot lately. And it's interesting to see that there's a trickster deity in Buddhism as well. And that there's a secret society called the jesters who use, uh, that sort of symbolism. I mean, I wonder if they also use the tricksters from, you know, native American symbology as well. Cause that's a big thing that they talk about in a lot of cultures in North America. I didn't know that until recently, man. That's really fascinating that uh, there, I, I saw somebody make a video about it, but it is, it's like that, um, the black and white kind of creatures in Native American folk history. I can't remember what they were calling them, but at that tie was mind blowing to me. I was like, wow, this is fascinating that it even like goes back that deep. Mm. Yeah, no, I, um, I, I'm not sure. Hmm. So the black and white, I think that's a part of a certain culture in the South, in like Southwest United States or maybe Mexico or something. But yeah, yeah. it's like this symbol, uh, symbolized version of the trickster, like somebody who gives you the good and the bad or, or tricks you into realizing you're doing something bad or good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's really fascinating. I don't know. Stuff like that. I just like, my problem is I go off on so many different tangents that it's hard for me to like really get too, too proficient in like one area where I'm like, I can make a convincing enough argument about that subject to anybody. I'm like, uh, you kind of have to go with my sporadic, <laughs> like how I've put everything, you know, put everything together for myself. And 
yeah i'm not the best at like explaining things i think that's what's held me back from like making any type of like serious videos on that, that channel that you were talking to me about earlier i just kind of like whenever i feel uh like almost it's like whenever you get an idea for a song it's like divinely inspired like most artists will say that they you know just it's given to them from some like unknown area it's like their best ideas just came to them you know right well, um, it goes back to what you said about Michael Hoffman and James Shelby Downer about being in the place and the research kind of happens in a more of a mystical kind of way. And and right. that's kind of why I want to encourage you. Maybe if you look into your local area, that'll give you a little bit more of a voice. Because, I mean, obviously, you know, you learn all this stuff from other people and then you go and put it in a video that kind of feels you know, my, it would be hard for anybody to do that. I mean, it's just right. like, unless you had like a, a theory that maybe nobody else was talking about, but yeah. if you go into South Carolina or wherever you're, I mean, even Savannah, Georgia, which is close mm -hmm. by to where you're at, like, I'm sure there's tons of information that you can get into and kind of map it out. And even if it's not, you know, anything new would be new for your area and it might wake up some people that are in your area to be like oh wow our town is pretty freaking strange like every other yeah, place sure. in the world <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah especially with like how many people will like kind of focus on this area just that are interested in just his history itself right that's i've got a buddy of mine who's like not very into conspiracies but he's very into history so I'm like, I'm just trying to think of these books that I can sneak his way and just be like, yeah, well, the two aren't so far apart, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, or even if you can gleam some things from him and learn uh, about the local area and, and use that to inform your own research, because that's that's something I've been trying to do with Connecticut is just try to dig in as much as I can. And, and someone uh, just joined the Patreon today, actually, shout out to Rob B. He's in the telegrams all the time. He's taught mm -hmm. me a bunch of cool stuff about Connecticut just because, you know, he's older than me and been around yeah. longer and, and been into this stuff longer and has a, a, a lot of stuff to to share. So, yeah, don't be afraid to to spread out into your own area and figure out who else is thinking the same way. I think that's a big I've, I found it's a big thing that people get back to me and say they're doing after listening to the show It's like, hey, man, thanks for talking about this stuff. I, I now I'm looking into my own backyard, you know, so. Yeah, Definitely. it's so easy to get caught up in like, you know, all these different areas that you almost like never consider where you're at, you know, just geographically as like a place that you can really, but that's whenever I was listening to you and Michael Wan's podcast, I was kind of like that idea opened me up to that being interested in that. Wow. I figured the location, there's probably, yeah, like you're saying, there's plenty to look into just like right around this 30 minute time span, you know? Yeah, and we're all connected too. And you're not too far from those Georgia Guidestones either. So I wonder how no, those line up right. with, with everything going down there. Maybe the, are they, do you think they're on the 33rd degree line or close to it or no? They form this this pattern. If that, It's one of the side points of this pattern of like, if you take the those and line them up with, I believe, Fort Sumter or at some point in Charleston, or no, actually it's Paris Island right near where I live. Paris Island, the Georgia Guidestones, and then some point maybe up in DC, it forms this triangle. And I can't remember what it was called, but I saw a researcher point that out before. And I was like, whoa, that's pretty interesting because I'm like right there. Yeah, that would be um, definitely a place to start. I don't know. As someone who, who doesn't live there, I would say if I lived there, I would drive down that line and see what else, what other weird stuff is in between, you know? That's true. It'd be a cool road trip too. Kind of like the dead part of the, <laughs> you go off on the highway system sometimes in South Carolina and Georgia, it's just like nothing for miles. Yeah. But it's more interesting than the interstate. So I'll yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, indeed. I have a lot of fond memories just from this past year because of how traffic kind of loosened up in 2020 i drove all over oh, yeah. you know and and even in 2021 drove all over the place and, and i didn't expect to be out in the middle of nowhere in new england but yeah there i was it was awesome but you yeah, never know you never know what you'll find out there no i'm excited to see what else is gonna pop up i don't know it's 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 a lot it's like overwhelming which is why a lot of people don't get into this stuff and you know they feel like they can't get if they can't get past that initial breakdown of like what they previously conceived is like, I don't know, reality and, you know, as a way to say it, then it, it just totally throws them off. But if you do get to the point where you can 
be like, okay, well, I've been lied to at a lot of different points, but that also means that I have a lot of new truth to like actually learn. And I can, you know, use this newfound sense of intuition to gleam at myself instead of having to rely on like one or two different people to really give me all of the points on a piece of information. Yeah. I don't know. Another tangent, but <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, we're almost at uh, two hours, Kent. I want to yeah, man. thank you for joining me, brother. And thank you for your support. And I Absolutely, want the man. listeners to know where to go to support you. Kent Wood Music, right? That's the place to go on YouTube. And then you have Aether or is that Ether or Aether? Ether is how I say it, but it's A-E, you know, T-H-E-R, which is just like, I think what they say is the fifth element in alchemy. And yeah, that was, uh, there's a, oh man, I'm drawing a blank, but there's a philosopher that has a, a little piece of work called either or. And so I just thought that was a fun play on words, but yeah, man, thank you so much for having me on, man. This has been a blast. Like, I don't, I don't really get to talk about this stuff too often to anybody. So it's been, it's been really fun and I appreciate it. But yeah, it's Kent Woods music on pretty much anywhere you'd go. Spotify is cool. SoundCloud, Bandcamp all these different places. And then you can also find me on with the same thing on Instagram and then either or is just YouTube or Instagram. And I just make different videos compiling other people's stuff for like making my own videos occasionally. I've only done like a handful of those. So, and then yeah, that's oh, uh, heavy honey on SoundCloud. And right. then if you guys want to keep an eye out, I'm starting to record again. And then I'm also recording with my buddies as heavy honey. So Cool. We've got a SoundCloud, and then we'll have stuff on Spotify and YouTube and that, all that at a later point. And a new EP is coming soon. You said you were starting to work on that. Yeah, man. I, I, I got to overhaul how I've been recording everything onto this new laptop. So I, I was planning on starting at the beginning of this like a week ago or so, but I haven't had the chance yet because I have to kind of switch everything over later on. But once I get back up on that, I've already got like a, two songs worked out, and I'm just going to keep building on that, put another four-songer out there. See how see how it goes. <laughs> right on. So if you guys want to check that out, I actually bought a ton of costumes. So I'm making a music video for one of my songs that I have already put out called The Answers. So that if you check out my YouTube and Instagram, that'll be out like hopefully within a month or so. Yeah. Cool. Well, Kent, thank you again, brother. I'm glad you came here and I'm glad we got into everything we got into, man. A lot of interesting stuff yeah, from secret societies to the music industry. A lot of great researchers were mentioned. And I hope one day, you know, you get added to that list and, and people mention Kent Woods when they're talking about stuff that they learned, because I don't doubt it that you're going to be coming up with some cool stuff, whether it's about South Carolina, secret societies or, or whatever else it is, brother. But either way, you're more than welcome to come back on the show. And, and yeah, man, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for listening and enjoy the moment wherever you are in the now. There's something, you know, obviously timing prevailed, but, uh, you know, synchronistically so. It was uh, uncanny, the timing, uh, you know. So, Weird, man. Weird. Right. right. So let's, uh, let's get right into it, brother. I mean, for those who haven't heard of you before, you've been on Sam's show once. Uh, you have your own podcast now. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your show, and all that good stuff. Yeah, and uh, my name's Evan D. I uh, host a small show, uh, Occult 45. Is the name of it. Yeah, thanks, man. But we go into all things cryptozoology, UFOs, you know, every, all the good stuff. But yeah, man, I'm, an, I'm a union electrician by day, so I'm doing that kind of during the day. And then at night, I work on my show. Super into music, man. I do he heavy metal and reggae. I play guitar and bass and rock out with that. I'm a self-taught mycologist. That's one of my other big hobbies. Got into that. I've been into it for a while, but I I just got like seriously into it. Yeah. About like a year ago. 
Well, it seems like more of a, a legal prospect now. I mean, seems like you can actually get a real job doing that stuff now, huh? Yeah, that would be really sweet. Like out west, they got it going on, man. They got it going on. But yeah, I I am from Connecticut, the same area as you. Yeah, yeah. Shout out two hundred three. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm the eight six zero way up there near Massachusetts. But yeah, I uh, a couple of years ago I ended up moving to Florida. I had some serious drug problems going on when I was up in Connecticut, actually. And uh, you know the opiate pan uh, epidemic that was crazy up there. I know it's still just crazy everywhere, but uh, yeah, I was caught up in that, the whole fentanyl thing, all that. So that's what kind of really like changed my, the path that I was, I was going down a really bad path. And then I ended up going to Mexico for an Ibogaine experience. And that's what you booked me on zero. That's what I was talking about. Right. I, w I went there and did Ibogaine and then I smoked the five methoxy DMT from the toad and that totally changed my life. And then I started exploring with NN DMT. And ever since then, I just been experimenting with those a lot those mm -hmm. substances see and, you're the uh, you're the perfect guy i need to talk to then because this has been on my short list of things to do according to my youtube commenters <laughs> they've been like one guy in particular he's like mark you gotta do dmt like every youtube video he comments and says i have to do it so maybe we can Maybe you can walk me through it but yeah man that's that's rough i'm really happy to hear that you turn that around because as a delivery guy, I've been all over Connecticut, good neighborhoods and bad ones, and it's it's definitely rough for sure. I'm glad to see that you made it out of there because Connecticut is pretty unforgiving when it comes to folks that get marginalized, and especially once you start you know, doing street drugs. Luckily, I was always so afraid of anything harder than like, I was even afraid of weed when I was young, young, and saw people smoking weed for the first time. I'm like, no way, I'm not a never going to do that, you know, and now look at me, like I'm doing a whole show talking about this stuff, but yeah, I, I'm really, I'm really glad to, to see that, that, that happened for you. And also psychedelics kind of made that happen. Cause I think so many people put this big stigma on drugs in general and put them all in one big category. But when you really go through it the way you have, you realize like, now nah, these drugs are not, this is not a drug. This is medicine. No, DMT, plant medicine, these are medicines. They're not meant to intoxicate us like these pharmaceuticals are. Yeah, I was just re really grateful to the psychedelics found me when they did. Mm -hmm. And the crazy, th the crazy thing about it too, like a year prior, I was like really trying. So 2019 is the year I went to Mexico, March 19th of uh, 2019. And actually the night that I tripped on Ibogaine too, the moon was full and it was the... Sonoran Native American, the moon of new beginnings, the night that I tripped coincidentally. Yeah, it was really crazy. Yeah, so I'll never forget that day, that night. March 19th of 19 is when I went. And uh, I had been researching Abigail like a year prior to going down there. And then a year later, I was just still trying to get clean, trying to get clean. But this stuff had such a grip on me. I was like, man, I'm out of options. And then my dad had mentioned, want to go try Ibogaine? I'm like, what? You know about that? that? Like, I, I was researching that, like, over a year ago. And he was like, yeah. So we, I flew down there and did all that. And it just totally changed my life. It showed me the other side of what I'm missing out on. And I uh, left that world behind. And that whole, like, addiction part of me was erased that night in Mexico. And then ever since then, I've been, yeah, it's so fast. Well, really fast forward after, after the Mexico trip, like a, f a few months, I was at a, a music festival in Connecticut down in Basra, a small festival called Camp Creek. And, um, I was at, I was there and this dude came rolling through our campsite and he was like, yo, you guys need anything? Mushrooms? I got DMT. And you know, they say about DMT, like, you don't find it. It finds you. So. I was like, oh shit, you have DMT. So I bought a half a gram of that and I say, I saved it like the whole, the whole day. And then that Saturday night I went back to my tent and I was in there by myself and I loaded it up in my packs vapor for weed, but I was like, this has to work. So I loaded it up in there. I hit it there in my tent and I was just fully enveloped in this like super mario world with these it was so vivid and it was right in my tent with me and they were just like 
I, it was so quick. I was just in that realm and I was like, whoa, now I get it. Now I see like all this psychedelic art and stuff made a lot of sense to me right then at that moment. And I was like, okay, this is no drug. This is like way beyond like, this is the shit that mm. they don't want us to know about. So then ever since then, I've been just exploring, you know, it's hard to come by. So you kind of, kind of got to well, look at it. Let me ask you about this, because I feel like I've heard others describe it this way, but I wonder, you know, why it goes back to this particular video game, Super Mario, because you're not the only person who's described these really deep psychedelic trips that way. And, you know, I mean, Super Mario has mushrooms in it, it's got little turtles, the dude, you know, he goes underground into this whole underground world. So the symbolism is there. Uh, like the colors are there like when you play that game it's like a whole nother color range right is that what you're describing F help help me understand this yeah. a little better as someone who hasn't done that yeah absolutely man it's it is so vivid and so and so intense like usually that every and usually every time i go to that realm it it is very similar to super mario it's just the, some of these beings are like so cartoony and so like the way that they present themselves and show you things is very cartoony and very it's just right up in your face and but yeah the super mario i i reference that a lot because it it does like a lot of the characters and beings within that realm it just it reminds me of that a lot mm. all right now but, have you ever and you know this isn't to confront what you're saying, but have you ever wondered maybe if that experience is particular to your mind somehow? And like, maybe if I did it, I wouldn't see Super Mario. Cause that's not a game that I played a lot of. I, maybe you didn't play that game a lot. You know, you see where I'm kind of going with that. Do you think it has anything to do with previous experiences it, or is it the, the energy itself of this material, this medicine? I, I think it is the energy itself of, mm -hmm. of the material. I mean, not everybody breaks through and has these crazy, like being like a lot of people, <clears throat> some people might do DMT and be like, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, I didn't get any of that, but I really think that the, whatever's on the other side, these, these things that I interact with, I think they know when, when you're ready to, to see them. Cause like they won't show themselves to somebody who's not ready for that. Cause I mean, not everybody's ready to see like a, 10 foot tall praying mantis creature like working on your brain like that can shock the hell out of you like you know mm. but i don't know man because I, I just i just had the guys from dreaming jaguars on my chant on my podcast and we're talking about you know the similarities between experiences and you start realizing like okay i'm not the only one seeing this like people around the world are seeing the same thing and like some and every time I go to the go to the DMT space, like I break through. It's every single time. Like I got the method for doing it, and I I see the same stuff every time. Sometimes I interact with the same beings. Even most of the time, it is the same beings. They're like very like elf looking, but yeah, man. I mean, what if it? Another thing I want to say too is if it was in my head, why is my head gonna project? I mean, because I've had these deep experiences where. I've had these like gray type beings. That's the only way I could describe them. They shoved a tube into my chest and I, my chest got like really, really hot. Like I, for, I woke up in this like pink, like fluid. And it was just like in the matrix when he wakes up in that tank and hit the big ass needles in his head. And he wakes up in that pink fluid. He's like, what the fuck? And he pulls the needle out. I woke up in that same exact type of fluid and I could see like outside there was like these shadowy figures and all of a sudden this big tube like comes through the fluid that I'm in and it goes right into my chest and my girlfriend who was watching me through the experience she saw me grab my chest right at that moment so whatever they were doing to me in that realm was directly affecting my body right back here so that's written why would my brain project that you know and just these i've had other ones too where they they stuck some kind of weird like tool in between my front teeth like they were like this like elf looking guy was like right in front of me and he like stuck this big like thing like in between my teeth and then he like looked over his shoulder at like his buddy or whatever and he was like like yeah see what i'm doing to him like he, do he doesn't really like this and then he like looked back at me and he was like just nodding his head 
And then when I came back to my body that time as well, I just had this crazy like metallic taste all through my mouth. So whatever he was doing to me, like traces of it, like bled over into this reality. So those really deep experiences like that. I mean, I don't know why your mind would even project something like that, mm. you know? Right. Well, and yeah, I don't distrust you and I don't distrust the experience you're relaying. I think it's important, you know, at least for myself, because I haven't experienced anything like that. And I'm very curious. I hope that, you know, learning about this in this way doesn't maybe bias my own experience, but it sounds to me like what's happening is very external you know like as you were saying you know it wasn't a projection of your mind because your body's responding you know there are things happening after these experiences that correspond with things during the experience so you're making a really interesting case for it obviously i'm gonna be a little paranoid a little skeptical we're conspiracy theorists you know that's how we roll so like what obviously this has benefited you right you're no longer addicted to those harmful drugs right so there's one on the pro con list are there any other pros or any cons on the list of you know like if you were to sit back and say okay what has my life been like doing this dmt do you say there's more pros than cons oh definitely man definitely the pros highly outweigh the cons i mean the real on the only real con is once you see this stuff, there's no one seeing it, you know, and that, that's one thing I make very clear to like people who even would ask me to think about trying it. it. And I used to say, oh, everybody needs to like when I first did it, I was like, everybody needs to know this. Like you need to do this. Like, well, there's aliens, but like, but now I'm like, dude, I don't think I'm, I don't think everybody's really ready for that. Like, because like I said, not everybody's really ready to have these like alien creatures like doing like psychic surgery on you. You got to be ready it's very intense you got to be ready for that but mm. you know the pros i mean yeah man it just shows you there's so much more out there that's like so much more it's the most interesting thing in the world to me i mean the whole realm and just everything involved with it is just amazing so that kind of helped me leave that whole world behind because i was like i don't need that anymore like i'm this has me like researching. I know I'll be researching and doing this stuff for the rest of my life because there's just, it's just endless, endless learning and endless lessons, endless right. knowledge. Well, and it feels like the perfect remedy for our spiritually null world. You know, like we live in this world where unfortunately everything has been, you know, really commercialized and the, you know, material aspects of life the superficiality of life has been emphasized to the point of now we have you know scientism literally it feels like you know when we talk to folks like ryan bledsoe who say these beings are light beings it feels like that's kind of what you're describing to me when you say things like psychic surgery and and the, the pros definitely outweigh the cons the only con is that you can't turn back i mean that that feels like uh you know, a whole nother world and, and obviously somewhere where maybe I should be, folks. You hear? Evan oh, is true. is talking me into it. All right. So no no more there's no need for the YouTube comments anymore. But you know, to your point about it finds you, it did find me. You know, I don't wanna reveal who, but a past guest sent me some. I've had it for a while and I just kind of been sitting on it because I'm like just because she sent it to me, does that mean it's really meant to be? You know, she sent me a bunch of other stuff too. You know, it wasn't like, you know, it didn't really fall on my lap in like a silver platter kind of way that I want it to. Maybe I'm just being like picky or whatever. But but yeah, I, there's definitely some hesitancy on my end, if you couldn't tell. Well, yeah, and that's, that is important too, having that respect for it. Because like, I mean before I go into like, and this is the only thing that makes me do this. Like before I go into that realm, like my hands start shaking and I, my heart starts beating like, cause I know what's about to happen. And I've had these super profound, deep, intense, uh, like ET experiences with this stuff. So like before I go in there, like my, my brain knows what's about to happen. So I get just really, I have a lot of respect for it. Because mm. if you go there without the respect and there's an entity in your face asking you, what are you doing here? You better be ready with an answer. Right. Because you, this stuff will, yeah, it'll smack you down. If you're, it's just such a quick, 
freaking everything's so fluid and moving around. It's just a lot to take in, and it's a very intense experience. Now, is there any carryover into your, let's say, normal waking consciousness? Do you, you know, obviously, you remember these things very vividly because you can't forget them, but are there any, like, synchronicities or strange things that have happened where you think maybe these beings are kind of pointing you in the right direction even though you're not tripping? I, yes, dude, yes. Like, there will be so... so when I first the first like crazy synchronicity for me so right when I got to San Diego I was coming back to the east coast from Mexico and I, I get out of the Uber to go into San Diego airport I get out of my backpack I get out of the Uber I look to my left big ass sign it says you are smarter and stronger than you realize I was like whoa okay like th this is my life now what so, and ever since then, just synchronicity after synchronicity, there's signs everywhere. There will be something from a trip that I see in my, in, and I just like, no, all right, I'm in the right spot. I, I chose the right way to go. I, ch I took the right path today. You know, just these little synchronicities that m mean nothing to somebody else, but you just know instantly like, okay, I see you. And j just, yeah, man, I'll, I'll smell it in random places. You, I'll smell or taste. And a lot of people say that too. After you, after you have an experience, you'll be in random, like I'll be driving, I'll get a whiff of it. Like, oh shit, there's DMT or like eating random stuff. You'll taste it because it's got a very distinct smell and taste. So you'll smell it randomly at different times just stuff like that and i wonder if you know we lived in a world where things weren't so chemicalized and polluted if we would have more of these dmt experiences naturally like i'm wondering maybe there would have been plants in the past that would have had that inhibitor in it so that when you ate the right you know recipe you would have had that experience you know, maybe just like mildly, right? Obviously, Aya is very intense. You know, you're, 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 it's a ceremony, but according to, you know, chemistry, there's DMT in, in most plants. So it, it's something that you really can't like, you really can't like pigeonhole it. Cause if it's so ubiquitous, there's got to be a reason why. Like, and the fact that it has such a profound experience, you have such a profound experience within this realm i mean it just adds to that curiosity like what this stuff is everywhere and then on top of that you smoke it and it brings you in this whole nother realm very weird man right. it's it's such a weird thing but yeah the natural experience is like i know we can get there just by breathing you know it's like these monks are onto something man they know about this but yeah, I'd like to, I do fly, I do do, I'd like to do float tanks and stuff like once in a while. We got a place here in Florida. It's awesome. I try to go there as often as I can, but I've had experiences in there just, just breathing, you know, right. the, the, the fluorides or whatever. Like when you close your eyes, you see these colors, like when you're in that tank, it's really, really crazy. Right. The sensory deprivation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's a lot of what monks did even now to this day there are you know sacred spaces where monks live or that are completely dark and they go and spend you know, however many days or weeks in a cave or in this dark place and yeah man it's just it feels like something happened in the past 50 or 60 years where you know parallel reality ripped open because you know i'm sure your family you know isn't so i mean maybe beside your dad, because he knew about Ibogaine. But like, if I tried to explain to my grandmother that there are, you know, mantids healing my brain when I smoke this stuff, she would think I'm literally psychotic. Like, she wouldn't believe me at all. <laughs> it is such well, a big right. change, you know? Right. And that's where my family thinks I'm crazy, man. And it, another synchronicity, too. I heard you saying, like, your, your grandparents are from New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. My meme and Pepe are also from New Brunswick. Oh, shit. And they moved to, to Connecticut also. And so it's just weird. Like this, like, yeah, I never, I, I don't think I've met anyone who has a meme and pe pepe too. I mean, I don't yeah. know a lot of fellow Frenchmen, but yeah, that's cool, man. I think a lot of, a lot of our ancestors left New Brunswick around that time and came to Canada or Connecticut for some reason. There was something going on here that they liked. Well, it's too cold up there, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's for ha sure. Have you been there before? 
I've been as far north as like Rangeley, Maine, but no, sadly haven't been across the border yet. Okay. I've visited New Brunswick a few times. It's, yeah, it's cold up there, but I've been in the summer. It's nice. It's nice. Very cool. Yeah. My, my grandfather was from Edmonston. So like right around Fort Kent, Maine and all that, that area up there, but definitely on my bucket list of places I need to go before I croak. <laughs> definitely, man. Definitely. But yeah, dude, going back to the 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 plants with the inhibitors and stuff you know that's why like mushrooms to me are like the perfect psychedelic because all that's contained in the mushroom right you you eat you eat the mushroom you're good to go and ever since ever since mexico really every time i do mushrooms it's now it's to the point where i'm seeing the same type of beings when i do psilocybin so like i can just sense that they're there and if i do like 10 grams or more i start to interact with them open eyes in this realm like i can like it's the the same beings and i just know it's it's the same beings but yeah so it's it's really crazy cuz it's it, it is the same the same realm you know you have the psilocin molecule 4ho dmt so it's it's the same it's the same stuff it, yeah it it brings you to the same place Right, right. Very similar on a molecular level. I don't understand what that science term you just used was, but I think that's what you were getting at is they're very similar, right? Yeah. On a molecular yeah. level, psilocybin acts like DMT and vice versa. Very interesting. Exactly. I've never yeah. done a, a hero dose that much, but I, I've done mushrooms a fair amount. And, and yeah, I don't, I mean, geez. I really just need to like go for it, man, because I feel like well, I can't relate a little bit here, but at the same time, I'm extremely curious, you know, and I wonder, you know, you said that this is going to bring you uh, pretty much unbounding inspiration to keep researching things. That's awesome. I feel like whatever is inside my brain that makes me crazy already kind of has that going on, which is why I'm a little bit hesitant because I'm like, well, what if I fuck up? you know, the way things are now, if I do DMT and I like lose track of myself or something, maybe that's just total like fear, but, uh, but that I can't, you know, help, but feel like, eh, maybe I don't need this, you know? Yeah, man, that's a good thing. I mean, not everybody needs it. You know, it's just cool to see this other side of things and no, and know that it's there. Right. Oh, uh, it, it kind of makes your normal. And I could, I could see that's why they don't want us knowing this shit because it does it makes you think like normal life is like a game basically and it it makes things a lot more fun because you know there's a whole nother thing going on out there that all ar all around us right now that we that we can't really see so it's right. it just it just makes everything a little more interesting. Have you heard the uh, theory that these more synthesized drugs are going to be used in like the metaverse haptic suit type situation where you know you're plugged into the metaverse and then you go and do some psychedelics and now the metaverse is like triple you know triple metaverse or something i don't know like multiple times of power what do you think of that as someone who's experienced it would you go in the metaverse tripping Shit, man. I don't know. I don't want, I don't want some virtual reality demons like latching onto me and right. coming in my place from, from the ether. But yeah, I mean, who knows, who knows, dude, that they, they, yeah. I mean, I don't know if I'd go in tripping, but <laughs> we'll see. Right. <laughs> well, let's, let's change gears a little bit. Obviously the, the Ibogaine, the DMT, that was a part of your awakening but you're already going to festivals. You're already seemingly into fringe culture, maybe too fringe, a little bit reckless. But was there certain like moments where you got keen to conspiracies earlier than that? Or was that something that happened recently? Nope. I, I'm glad you said that. So I've got this book here, the, the field guide to Bigfoot, Yeti and other mystery primates of the world. So I've literally, I've had this book since I was eight years old. Yeah. yeah, I even wrote the date in it, 2003. So I've, <laughs> right, I've, uh, been, I've been into this for a while. But yeah, man, I mean, when I was younger, so my my mom, my grandma, my uncle, and my all had a UFO experience um, up at Soapstone Mountain. It's in Summers, Stafford Springs, Connecticut. Okay. So 
So there's a mountain up there. It's made of all soapstone and it's got a sweet lookout too. If you take your girl up there, you can see like way into Massachusetts. It's really yeah. cool. Thank you. Yeah. I, we were up in Stafford Springs this summer, actually. It's interesting. We didn't go there though. Yeah, man. It's not a huge mountain, but it's a nice lookout. You can yeah. see way up and way up in the mass. But yeah, dude. And there's always like <clears throat> people see strange lights just in the sky above that mountain a lot. Even as recently as like two years ago, my aunt said, I see the lights in the sky. But so anyway, my grandma, my aunt, my uncle and my mom all had this UFO experience. They look outside and they're it's bright as day out. And my uncle had just pulled in on his three wheeler right coming from over the street pulled in he runs inside he's like hey you got to look outside they all look outside there's this big circular craft hovering above the barn in my grandma's yard and they all saw it and they they say that you could see these like big gears inside like turning but you could not hear it sound like you could see stuff like kind of moving but there was zero sound so and then this thing just like goes up in the sky, makes two two moves, and then it's just gone. So, and so I grew up hearing that story a lot, yeah. you know, and and my uncle even said, he used to tell me when I was little, he's like, dude, that night that that UFO was here, they took me up in that UFO. So like he, t he, he would always be joking about it, but like in the later years, he's kind of told, like when I started talking about DMT and stuff, he's told me, he's like, dude, I wasn't joking about that. But so, I mean, I don't know what happened that night. I wasn't there, but so my family did have a UFO, UFO experience. So yeah, I grew up hearing that story and the, the Bigfoot thing. I mean, I've been, I've been into that since I was a little kid. That's pretty much how I got started 10 years ago, started really looking into 9-11 and the JFK, like everybody. I mean, that's what got me going really. And I just started putting stuff together, doing my own research. And I was like, okay, they're not telling us about something here. And then once I started having these DMT experiences, I was like, solidified in the okay they're hiding a lot from us because i was like there's no way they don't know about this like some of this like coming back from the experiences like thinking about the men in black status like what the hell did i just see because like you know they're in some like underground like deep underground military base doing this shit well and that's why i have that amount of suspicion i even asked gordon white on a past episode you know what do you think about this? And he was like, well, it's a technology. So, you know, I would use it. He's like, just go for it. Just try it. You know, it's a technology. But I think he didn't really, I didn't want to like stop the conversation and go off on my own tangent there. But when he said that, I almost got a little more hesitant to do it because I'm like, yeah, it's a technology. That's exactly why I, I'm, I'm, I'm paranoid about it. But yeah, it just, it feels, you know, and I don't want to poo poo DMT because you've obviously had great, experiences on it and i don't doubt that i definitely don't doubt that i might and others might if they try it obviously we don't want to encourage people to do something that's unfortunately federally illegal but yeah hey if it comes into your life it comes into your life but there's just something about it that feels like man-made for the wrong intentions and and even acid felt that way. And I've done acid a bunch and I probably won't ever do it again because of that little bit of information that I learned, you know, concerning the old sixties movement and all of this cult influence on society to, I don't know, put us in this position that we're in now. I mean, you're from the same state as me. You know what it's like over here. It's not easy if you're not, you know, born with a silver spoon in your mouth to make it especially, you know, on the East Coast, you know, there's, there's established families, there's, you know, private institutions, there's a, you know, a bunch of ladders that other people have climbed. And if you want to get on one of them, you might get kicked off, you know, like that's just how, how it is. So to hear that you're making it happen in Florida is an inspiration, brother. And I'm wondering, have you gone out and looked for the swamp apes yet? The skunk apes? I'm actually, I'm actually going to a, the Florida Bigfoot conference this Saturday. So that's happening. Connor Flynn is going to be speaking there. He, I'm, I'm having, I'm having him on my show soon, actually, too. He, he runs a YouTube channel called Bigfoot Anonymous. And the, another synchronicity with that too, I, I just filmed an interview with David Weiss of Flat Earth Dave. And I, like a few days after I had published that episode, I was on my way home and I would listen to this podcast, uh, spaced out radio. 
I listened to them and they had this dude, Connor Flynn on. I was like, oh damn, this dude's on his shit talking about the skunk ape, all this stuff. And then I get home, I'm looking through the comments on my David Weiss video. He commented on that and said, great work. I was like, oh shit, that's the dude I was just listening to. Damn. So I, I emailed him. I'm like, you got to come on my show, man. And so he's going to come on my show now, but just weird, the synchronicities that let you meet people and, you know, in this podcasting world, it's really crazy. And well, and I think that's an indicator, again, that you're doing the right thing, brother. I mean, obviously, you turned your life around in a pretty profound way, and, and the, the DMT and the sort of astral energy that you've connected with is now guiding you. I mean, that's kind of what happened with me, in a way, with Michael Wan, right? I listened to this guy a bunch, and then, you know, one thing led to another, and now I'm doing a show with him, you know? And I feel like that's the kind of thing that's really cool with podcasting is there's this interconnectivity that goes on hyperspeed rather than like when you're just like kind of doing your nine to five like i was you want to reach out to these people but it just doesn't happen and it's because your frequency is still on that nine to five grind you know and and now that you're doing the podcast you got a cult 45 going on you got you got some some sort of energetic leeway for folks like this gentleman to come in and and fill in the blanks, man. I'm I'm interested to find out more. Bigfoot Anonymous and David yeah. Weiss. We haven't had him on yet, but we definitely will soon. Yeah, man. It was it was a good episode. The link is in the show notes on my on my episode. But it's yeah, it's it's really really sweet. Have hooking up with all these people. It's cool. You, I'm on your show now. I'm a big fan of your show, dude. Thank you. Yeah, man. So yeah, I'm going to the Bigfoot conference this Saturday. They're about an hour south from here. It's called Mayaka and it's uh like the green swamp. It's like all up through like Sarasota area. And yeah, there's people down there having some really weird experiences, man. A lot of like mind speak, you know, telepathy. These things are like people are seeing like shimmering beings, like a uh, camo and look just like the predator type shit, you know? So there's something going on uh, down there, but I mean, it's going on everywhere, you know, yeah. it's, it's not just here, obviously, but yeah, man. So I'm planning a trip too, with my buddy, Ron, we're supposed to go down there, just walking through the woods, seeing what we see, maybe have a GoPro going and just see what's up, you know, set the, set the good intention. You know, we're not there with guns trying to shoot these things. We just want to, some clues, like what the hell are you? Yeah. So we're, we're, we're going to go just walk through the swamp and see what's up, man. Cause I want to see one of these things. Yeah. When, when Tony Merkel was on the show, I asked him, uh, about this kind of thing. And I asked him if he thought that like electronic equipment, uh, might get in the way of, of like paranormal investigations. Cause these beings are, you know, their senses are, are more developed or more keen than ours are. Maybe they can hear the little buzzing of your cell phone, even though it's not audibly making a noise for us, but they hear that like, like a ringing in their ear and they peace out, you know? So I'm wondering, are you going to go like totally bare, no phone, no flashlights? Are you just going to like go out there like a, like a hippie and, and see what you see what you find? I mean, yeah, that I'm leaning towards that because I've heard that same thing. Like mm. the, and that's why we don't catch pictures of these things on infrared cameras. You know, they, they could see the beam or they can sense that it's a camera. They don't want to be seen. Yeah, these things, I think, are a lot smarter than we think. I'm definitely leaning towards like interdimensional type. But yeah, who knows, man? So I, I am leaning towards leave the cameras at home phone off, ju just have it with you just in case you need it type thing mm. and see what we see man because just there's people having some profound experiences out there in the woods yeah yeah my buddy chris lives down in florida and we did an episode a while back for the patreon because he he works at the zoo i don't remember what i think saint augustine but there was a, a person in jacksonville that called his zoo and they were complaining you know wondering maybe if there was somebody at the zoo who could help them figure out what was in their backyard Seems like an odd place to to go with that kind of problem. But the way she described the being in her backyard, it sounded very much like what you just mentioned about like infrared camouflage or like a sort of like a camo suit. But this being had like tentacles, like an octopus. So I don't know if, if the military is playing around with some kind of technology, but it would be, you know, it would be wise if they were to have technology that wasn't perfect to have some kind of like fail safe where, you know, it looks like an octopus and just confuse the shit out of people instead of them seeing maybe like an M16 rifle or something, you know? 
<laughs> or or they see a Sasquatch instead, right? Or 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 a dog man. So like, yeah, like it's you know. projecting the you know what the mind wants to see. But that's what they say about these internet dimensional beings in the first place, right? That they can kind of project their image onto us of what we see them as. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely definitely interacted with multiple types of beings the way that uh, they've been they've been projected i mean you know i've i've seen any anything from reptilians to crabs to felines to monsters like the whole, just everything i've seen endless types of beings so yeah i mean i don't know i don't know that's why we explore man yeah yeah for sure how about uh coral castle you ever make it down there you've been in florida for a while you ever go down there not yet. It's on the list, though. Yeah, we we definitely want to go there. I want to take the bike down there, there you go. go for go for a day trip and go go check that out. Yeah, and he he claimed to know the secrets of the ancient Egyptians. You know, mm. to 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 float those big rocks up on top of there. Right, right. And what's interesting, I found this out recently. I don't know if it made it to a podcast, but there was a couple other folks that were very similar to that guy that were doing stuff in the United States, and one of them built an underground garden in California. I forget what part of California now. It's like outside of San Francisco. But yeah, that, that there is something, some kind of technology going on. wonder if Florida, again, Disney World, right, is built there. Or is it land? I always get those confused. That's built in a specific area, not only so Disney can get like his own land and whatnot, but I feel like there's some energetic significance that makes that place, you know, the happiest place on earth. Have you ever wondered that, been into that, felt like uh, you're experiencing some kind of energy field while you're down there? I definitely do, man. I definitely feel that it's a, everybody's a lot more happy down here. I don't know what, what they got going on energetically, but yeah, like it makes me sketched out too. Like, like, okay, Florida and like all these places down here are like very laxed with the whole pandemic thing. And it's like, what if they're just trying to like get everybody to these places and then like close it off to everybody? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, okay, we're laxed here. Everyone's like, oh shit, I want to go down there. Like it's way better. And then they get everybody here and then like try doing some like crazy experiments or something. Close mm. off the border. Yeah. So. I mean, I, I'd rather be in Florida with all that coastline than in Texas, but either way, it does seem like they're pushing people uh, to those two states, yeah, it seems like an ideological divisive tactic, yeah, for sure. Have you experienced, like, anybody who seems to be, like, are there towns in Florida where people are going along with COVID protocol, or is it just straight up, no, nah, we're not doing it? Pretty much just straight up, we're not doing this. I mean, there's so many people here, though. You do have a few people who are going along with it, obviously. Mm. Um, that, that's everywhere. But I've heard, like, over on the East Coast, down towards, like, Key West, kind of, there's, like, one town that's, like, all Democrats and stuff, so they kind of... They're kind of really, really pushing it there, but that's probably like the only town I've heard of in Florida because, yeah, everyone here is just like, whatever, dude, like we're just going to live, live normally. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I kind of I got your, your thoughts on DMT and I was a little bit, I don't know, skeptical, but I think this next topic, I'm a little bit more skeptical and I might need a little bit more convincing. I don't want to put you on the spot, Evan, but... Tell me your thoughts on on flat earth, brother, because you put that in the notes. And, you know, I myself am not uh, against flat earth, closed off to it. I'm open to it. But I think I've said this enough on the show where I'm like, it's just not my my main interest. You know, it doesn't it doesn't tickle my fancy, but I'm willing to, you know, hear you out. And, and I want to understand why you believe in flat earth. Yeah, man. Good, good question. So yeah, I did just film that episode with David Weiss. We talked, we got into it uh, pretty good there. His presentation's phenomenal. But yeah, man, I mean, just, just using my senses, like we talked about early in that episode, it's just using my senses that we all have. I mean, they say we're spinning and stuff, but I don't feel any of that. I mean, and there's something in my core. I just have this like deep knowing that there's this big, big secret being covered up and yeah, man. So the, just all the things about, um, I mean, the stars, you, you look up at the stars and they are, 
revolving around us. It's not, we're not really, I mean, they wouldn't be in the same places year after year. If we were, all, if we were hurtling through space, moving at these crazy speeds that they say we're moving. I mean, it's just, you can see the stars, the same places like year after year. And the way the ancients kept, kept time and knew how to harvest things was from the stars. So, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't be up there like that if we were moving the way they say we do. And I just like, you go to the NASA videos, you see, you start seeing how they fake these videos and there's pretty much no one seeing it after that. And I mean, I yeah. just saw, I just saw a video the other day on Instagram where a guy like pops out of a cardboard box wearing a gorilla suit and then he like floats down the chamber, you know, they like pretend like they're swimming or whatever. And they like, he scares his brother or something that's also an astronaut and the astronaut like runs, you know, not run, but like floats like this, like they're swimming really fast down the aisle. And it just, it's like, A, aren't you guys supposed to be doing like really intense scientific work up there? B, isn't there like scientific equipment that might break if you're like running around playing pranks? And then C, like, it just it just doesn't make sense you know what i mean like you watch that that chamber footage and it feels like it's set up it feels like they're either in the back of a you know c130 and it's going like weightless or they're in like some kind of lab where they have you know who knows what that creates this kind of i don't know lessened gravity right and they're they're floating around but it just doesn't feel like they'd be doing gorilla pranks in space <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> yeah absolutely man and i've been saying that same thing since i was a kid man just like how is that re like there's no way like right. i don't know man i've just always been saying that and it's like these crazy distances they they want us to believe it's like 93 million miles to the sun i mean there's no way it's just and you, you brought up a great point with the stars too it's like you know how would folks navigate the seas to the degree of accuracy that they did if the stars were constantly fluctuating around right like if our earth is really moving such a degree around the sun why is the north star in the same spot and why are all the constellations kind of rotating around the north star have you ever seen that time lapse of like the north star kind of stays in one place and all the other stars kind of rotate around it yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, when, like, how could that happen on a ball spinning at the speeds they say it's spinning? I mean, it's just, it right. feels like they're hiding something. But I, again, like, just because I don't buy into the flat earth conclusion, it doesn't mean I don't, like, find all the evidence that people are using to support that conclusion interesting. You know, I just don't know if, if that leads me to say that the earth is a different shape. To me, it feels more like they're lying to us about how big the earth is or maybe even like some of the physical dynamics of how the earth works. Because, I mean, some occult, really occult stuff talks about how the earth is like a dodecahedron and has these like sort of flat sides that come together in a circle form, which, I mean, you couldn't measure a curve on a shape like that either, you know? So the videos that people do where they see the horizon and it keeps going and going and going, it's like, yeah, okay, well, maybe that exists on a dodecahedron. It's just because we're only measuring it against flat or round, you know, people kind of get it maybe a little bit right and say, okay, it's flat or, or they go, oh, it's round. But, you know, nobody seems to entertain this third, fourth or fifth option or possibility. Yeah, man. And the whole thing is like, I'm probably like 90, like 5% flat earth. Cause there's that, that 5% man, that is just, I, I have no idea. You know, I, I don't, I'm not saying I'm a hundred percent in, but I'm mostly there. Cause I mean, just the, I mean, of the, you can see Chicago across Lake Michigan or whatever it is like on a, on a ball earth that sh you shouldn't be able to see it that what you, the, it's like seven feet a drop or whatever per mile or whatever it is. And so you would see the water come up into those buildings. You zoom in with a good camera or something, you can see that city right. very clearly. So, right. I mean, it's, it's just kind of sketchy. The, all the stuff they told us can start being, being proved wrong. And it's like, okay, let me see, uh, look into this a little more. Mm. You know? Right. Right. And that, and I think really the, the point is to keep people from asking questions at all so they attempted to make it all sound very academic and scientific and all this but then you see a guy like neil degrasse tyson get in a debate 
And he's not more intelligent than the flat earther that's debating him. He's, if anything, sounds more childish, you know? I don't know if he's had a debate with flat earthers, but the way he handles that topic when I've heard him interviewed and the question comes up, it's very childish. It's a very, like, defensive reaction that, you know, if these folks were so confident in their science, why would they even, you know, why would it bother them at all, right, that people, you know, don't see it the way they do because if they you know if i came to some scientific discovery i'd probably just be like well if you don't see it that's your fault <laughs> you know maybe that's just how i am yeah man i yeah i mean i've heard him in interviews you know stumbling on words and stuff you ask him what gravity is he's like i really don't know so it's it's pretty sketchy the whole thing and there's just something inside me that just tells me like this is true like i don't know man it's hard to explain but yeah, man. And then that, that brings us right into Antarctica. I mean, that's one that interests me a lot. Like what is down there? And yeah, they tell us there's, it's very cold there. There's these uh, penguins that we can't disturb and all this stuff. And, but it's like, all right, well, if you guys are worried about the flat earth, take a flight from Chile to New Zealand and let's just get it over with. Right. Right. Let's and just, you can right. go right now. It's called, uh, I have it on my bookmarks, flightradar24.com. And it shows you all of the public fly, you know, airplanes that are in the sky, public commercial traffic, and none of them, none of them go over that Pacific spot where you would imagine would be the quickest way to get from China to the U.S. You'd think they would go over Hawaii. No, they go all the way up around towards the North Pole and then down the coast of California. And the same thing is true with flights from Buenos Aires to South Africa. You'd think they would go just directly across the Atlantic Ocean, but they're taking this wild, like, curved loop away. Wow, we're very interesting. Very interesting. Mm. Wow. Yeah, man, I mean, they... They don't want us going to Antarctica for some reason. That 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 just really interests me. That whole thing. I'd love to go there. I I applied at a, uh, a job to go there, but I never heard back. Now, when you say, you, what do you mean, like an electrician job or? Yeah. Oh yep. shoot. Okay. Yeah, there was this contractor doing work down there at McMurdo Station. Okay. And they, they were taking applicants. I put one in just for the hell of it, but I never heard anything back. Oh, you know? man. Well, tomorrow is the day you're going to look at your mailbox <laughs> find right. out you got a trip to Antarctica soon. That's well, cool, that, man. Yeah, man. The synchronicity thing, too, going back to that. The day after I filmed the David Weiss episode, I'm driving home from work. There's a truck right next to me. Uh, it's a big sticker on the back windshield that says, Research Flat Earth. That was the day after I filmed that episode of my podcast. So it was really crazy. I was like, all right, all right. World is much stranger than fiction, man. It really is. And I think even fiction doesn't do it justice. But if you had to pick maybe a theory on why they aren't letting us down there, do you think it's ice wall? Do you think it's Nazis, lizard people? Like, where does your mind go first when it comes to, like, why? The why question. Well, part of it goes to these stories of they found something under the ice. Part of an ancient civilization that's very high tech. They maybe maybe even have ships under the ice. I mean, there's there's stories about that. But the other part of me is saying it is an ice wall, and if you go past the wall, there is other lands beyond there that are warm, just like here, and there's people there also. Just mm -hmm. like us. Right. Admiral yeah. Bird. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's where a big part of me sits right now is there is, and you know, we talk about the entrance to the earth, inner earth. I mean, there could be a hole down there that leads to an inner world, you know, that maybe they escaped there after the cataclysms and they've been developing there ever since. And they're just so much ahead of us. And they, our, our leaders met with their leaders and said, all right, we, we got to keep this quiet from our people right now. So we're not going to let them down here and you don't let them see you and we'll just have this agreement. But yeah, man, that's where I sit right now. Mm. Right. Yeah, and I mean, even here in the States, you have all this talk of underground bunkers. I mean, East Coast, specifically out there in the West Coast, there's a bunch of talk of underground bases and whatnot. Who knows? Maybe they all connect. Maybe that's why they're 
putting all this money into digging these tunnels. I mean, they talk so much about billionaires going into space. Meanwhile, the military seems to be going underground and drilling these big tunnels. Who knows? Maybe they all connect. Maybe they go under the ocean. You know, it just, it feels like, and what you said earlier about Florida and Texas being maybe like these silo states that they're pushing all of the free thinkers to, it just, it, it goes right into that whole Agenda 21 thing where they want to push everybody into the cities, keep all the natural spaces, you know, wild, quote unquote, even though the military is still going to be there and they're the number one polluters on the whole planet, folks. So they're, they're, they're not working with Mother Earth's interests in mind, yet they're going to have autonomy over these wild places if this Agenda 21 comes to fruition. But yeah, man. And then... I think we were talking about this with Donut, shout out to the Donut Factory, and how they have these celebrities and politicians that go and meet down there in Antarctica. And I'm asking Donut, I'm like, if all of these people are going there, like, what's the infrastructure that they have on Antarctica? Because, like, if you went there to do that electrician job, like, what, would you stay in some little scientist camp base, like a little shack, you know? Like, that's what we see in the documentaries and movies. But if politicians are going there, they're not staying in some shack. They're staying in a Ritz Carlton. They're staying in a, you know, a nice hotel. And and if if there's a hotel, well, then they have to have staff. They have to have management. They have to have, you know, all of these things going on, which would suggest that there's a whole population of people living down there. I mean, unless they stay their whole time on an aircraft carrier or something like that, you know, you got to imagine that there's some sort of infrastructure, even a city that these people are going to when they're visiting Antarctica for you know, whatever political meetings. Donut said they were fake, though. He said they found out that it was fake. I don't know, man, because I heard that before Donut brought it up. So, you know, have you heard anything about that? Important people going there to visit? Absolutely. I've heard, you know, I've heard the Pope going down there, Obama, John Kerry, you know, all these big people. And yeah, I mean, why are they going down there? Like, are they, are they meeting with beings from beyond the ice wall? Are they... Are they doing meetings with these guys? Are they? Are did they find something that the scientists really needed to show them? Or you know, under the, under the ice, we just we just don't know. But yeah, it's I have heard that a lot about these big names going down there. And yeah, you'd think yeah, there's got to be some kind of inf infrastructure because yeah, these guys aren't going to stay in in a scientist camp. Yeah, I agree with that. And that that episode you did with Donut that was really great. I listened to that today talking Thank about you. these. Yeah, man, talking about these octopus in Antarctica using the telekinesis on those science or the military. What was that all about? Yeah, so there's this deep underground or under ice lake called Lake Slaskov something in Russian. I'll, I'll try to. And apparently these Russians were down there doing some tests, trying to figure out this underground lake. And yeah, I guess there was a species of squid or octopus that they had never encountered before that was attacking them in this chamber and not just with its tentacles but with like psyops like it's literally psi attacking them with psychic abilities or something yeah that was very interesting i was like wow that's really crazy so it's it's all right well now they're saying is dragon breath cave i don't know if that's it so in the McMurdo Dry Valleys of Antarctica, there exists a lake buried year round under an ice cover. I think it's called Lake Vostok, but it's this article's not putting it right in the front of the Yeah, there's Lake Vida as well, but I thought it was Lake Vostok. Either way, yeah, there's some crazy ass octopus down there, bro. <laughs> Yeah, that, that name sounds familiar, Vostok. Yeah, the oct octopus are weird things, man. And then you guys were, I heard you guys talking about the, the on The Simpsons, these these o octopus aliens that run the world through the presidency. And we see the, Sim the Simpsons over and over again predicting these world events before they happen. And it makes you wonder, like, are they showing us? Like what's going on here? Because I mean, I have a shirt. It's a it's a fit for an autopsy uh, shirt. They're like a death core. I know you like that heavy stuff too, right? Well, Shane made a, a heavy breakdown of my my intro music, so I think people got that impression from there. I'm in the underground rap, the screamo rap, or not screamo rap, but like the the heavy rock, like that was really popular where we're from. Like when we were growing up, 
never got into it like the post-punk like hardcore scene and that never really got into that but i do really appreciate shane's remix of my intro because that shit was sick despite the fact that i'm not really into that music yeah that that is really sweet he, he did a great job on that but uh yeah man so i have this shirt it's the two octopus like aliens like one is holding hillary's head and one is holding trump's head it was like <laughs> it's from 2016 so it was from this tour that they did called enslave america tour but so that shirt has those two weird monsters on it and it makes you start start thinking like are these these evil forces control in disguise in these bodies of these high up people it makes you start thinking like that could be true i mean you you talk about these ancient people like the whole Anunnaki thing, they got so high tech that they could fit. They figured out how to transfer their consciousness into new avatars and extend their life for hundreds of thousands of years. I mean, that could be what, what this is exactly. Like they, they've been just creating new bodies, transferring their consciousness and they're still controlling us. Like, so. Right. Right. And you know, Ray Kurzweil and all them are very, very keen on making that actually feasible technologically over there in silicon valley but yeah i don't know man i i I definitely believe there's some sort of parasite being that can kind of like skin walk like the skinwalker right like you could shape shift or or even like take over a human consciousness but as far as like the transhumanist stuff i don't know if if they're going to i really don't know if they're going to accomplish what they think they're going to accomplish because they think the soul the human soul is like it's just not you're not able to restrict it in that way uh, what are your thoughts on that and transhumanism yeah i don't think they're gonna be able to successfully do that because i think there's a big part of it that that they're not understanding like whatever made us understands it fully you know that's what i'm that's what i'm thinking like these people that are trying to do the whole transhumanism thing, Neuralink, you know, this whole, this whole thing, connecting with our mind to the internet. I mean, it's, I don't, I think they're missing a, a big part of it that, that was understood by these uh, more ancient civilizations. Mm, right. Right. Now, when it comes to going full circle on what we started this conversation up with, have you looked into psychedelic use in those ancient cultures or maybe even experienced anything in your ex like trips that would suggest looking into that aspect of life, the ancient realm? For sure. For sure. So we, we see the hieroglyphics in ancient Egypt where we see mushrooms, you know, depicted in these, in these hieroglyphics and so they were definitely, they, they knew about it. And, you know, then we, then we go to, you overlay the third eye, the eye of Horus, you overlay that to the cross section of the brain, lining up with the pineal and the thalamus. That's, that's pretty compelling there. It, it does look very similar. And in my experiences, I very often, I see like ancient Hebrew and like these weird occultic symbols and hieroglyphic type symbols flowing around me. Sometimes these beings come up to me and they beam it into my like forehead. Like they'll just like sh open their hand and it'll just be all these symbols flood in my mind. And like the symbols are ve like very familiar to me. They, they look very familiar. And so that's what I like equate it to like ancient Hebrew. I say that a lot because the, the, the symbols that they use communicating with me look a lot like you're okay. you're you're making it sound enticing bro and and it's cold as hell where i'm at right now i know it's probably a little cozier down there in florida but it's cold as hell and i've been inside for a few days now at this point so i'm down to freaking get out of my get out of my zone if i can who knows maybe that'll <laughs> maybe that'll be what i need <laughs> Yeah, man, it's pretty cool to know that, you know, like, well, I have that whole other, like, whole other world right there in that drawer. Mm. Evan D, brother, this has been fun. I want to give you a chance to plug your show, Occult 45, let the listeners know that I will be there soon, and we'll be having you back on soon for a, a full episode. I'm not quite sure which episode this one will tag on the end of, but yeah. We've been, we've been doing a lot. I got like 10 episodes in the basket right now, ready to be released. So if folks want to listen to all those right now, 
You got to sign up for the Patreon. This isn't a free show, folks. This is how I get paid through the Patreon to keep this show flowing, keep cool guys like Evan D coming on the show, having great conversations. And I'm sure Evan's got some ways that you can support him too. So enough about me. Evan, tell them where they can go to find you, brother, and all that good stuff. Yeah, man. So right now my show is available on all platforms that you get your podcast. It is called Occult 45 with Evan D. And yeah, man, my YouTube and everything is on there. The the links for all that is on there. All the music that you hear for my intro and my outro, that was recorded by me. I, I would play it. I play that all on guitar. And uh, yeah, so I recorded all that music. And if you want to send me guest suggestions or you have questions about my show, Evan D Occult 45 at yahoo.com is where you can reach me directly. Right but, on. Amen. Well, I am reaching out to you right now because we need to get you into Alt Media United. We got to put you up on our website there if you're down with that. And folks, go support the man Evan D at Occult 45. And thank you for being here. Thank you for tuning in. Have a great moment wherever you are in the now. Peace.